Daniel, Philip Daniel, where are you? Philip Daniel has joined. So, Jesudas, can you put your video on? Okay. okay. Hello. Jesudas has Jesus put video on. You can make him a post. Hmm? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, brother Jesus. Okay, just to make. Thank you, brother. Philip Daniel, can you put your video on? Just a few minutes, brother. Okay, okay. Uh, just a minute. Philip Daniel is put up. Can you see his, his face? Oh, put him on. Oh, let's see his name. It's fine, Philip. It's okay. Hmm? Then who's there now? I spoke the list. Vincent, did you get? Hello, bro. Yeah. Vincent, Vincent is, Vincent is come on video. Okay, okay bro. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Chetan and Jerusha, uh, can you put your video on? Chetan and Jerusha. These are the main Sunil is not. Well, Mrs. Ben. Chetan, brother, just put your video on. Chetan, Chetan will be putting his video on. Ah, Chetan has put a video. It's okay, uh, Chetan now, just to make you co-host. Thank you,
Penny and team, it's time for you. Sunil, 
can we can we test your audio uh yes can you hear me yes just say a, one a sentence or so yeah test just testing that you guys can hear me okay in preparation yeah. for meeting to start in 5 minutes yeah it's clear uh sanjay uh, any idea where you can test his audio also um yeah let me text him Now, Sanjay, can we check your audio? audio? You're muted. Uh, voice is not so clear. Sanjay, can you just say a few words or a sentence? Oh, what's happening, Benny? But there's some Yeah, the audio is a little bit uh, uh, restrained. Oh, well. better? No, yeah, a little bit better. better. Okay, I'll just I'm gonna try a different microphone. How about this? Is this better? That's better. Yeah, that's much better. I don't know if you can increase the input volume yeah, a little bit. No, but, I can. Yeah. It's this microphone. I was using a different microphone. Hold on. I mean, thought the lapel microphone would be easier. Let me just use yeah. the microphone. Okay. Um, is this better? Yeah, much yeah, better. Just, just say a few words, brother. Just to. Hello, one, two, three. Can you check? One, two, three. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, it's okay. I think it's okay. Audio is fine. You want me to increase the volume or it's okay? No, it's okay. This volume is okay. Okay, thank you.
If you could put your location also, it will be good along with your name. All right, uh, welcome everybody to this global Zoom meeting. Uh, thank you to Brother Matthew Thomas and the team for hosting this event um, on a recurring basis. We have a special theme today for working professionals uh, and we'll get to our speaker in just a second, but uh, I'd just like to welcome everybody and we'll start with an uh, opening prayer, a quick announcement, then we'll have a couple of songs and then we'll move into the, the main event. So let's, if you don't mind uh, uh, joining together with me as we uh, pray to the Lord and lift up this meeting and pray that he alone is glorified. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, even in a virtual meeting like this. Thank you for the hungry hearts that have gathered around the world, Lord, to hear of your goodness, to hear your word. I pray that you would Feed each one, Lord, that your word would go out and would not come back empty-handed, Lord. Thank you for their hunger and their thirst, Lord, and I pray that it would be filled, Lord. I pray that you would fill out your Holy Spirit on our speaker, Sanjay, as well. And I pray that you would anoint him with a mighty word to speak uh, about how we are to live as examples that glorify you in the workplace, Lord. Ones that are filled with the Holy Spirit, uncompromising, yet a beacon of light for you and working diligently as unto you and not unto men, Lord. May you be glorified through this meeting. I pray for all of the logistics as well, the audio, the video, the, the music team, the songs, Lord, that you alone would be uplifted, that, would, that, would, that everything would go, out, uh, go through smoothly, Lord. Be glorified in our midst tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, thank you, brothers and sisters, men and women uh, around the world for joining. Uh, we have one quick announcement. If you don't mind, we would like you, if you're on the Zoom, uh, to add your name and your location of where you're from, uh, specifically city and country. If you are part of a church, uh, you're welcome to put the church name as well. But if not, uh, we'd love to understand, especially which country or which city you are uh, dialing in from across the world. Um, we've got some great information at the, at the end of the meeting in terms of uh, contact information if you'd like to hear more, but it also helps us understand uh, the contacts from across the world and, and the demographic as well. So if you don't mind putting in uh, those details, just if you can just go to the participant tab, click on your name and hit the uh, menu item that says rename as you can see, I've done this as well. And uh, just type in, modify your name with a comma separated to put in your uh, city and country details. I, my name is Sunil Poonin. I'm one of the elders here at our New Covenant Christian Fellowship Church in San Jose, where my brother Sanjay Poonin is an active member as well. Um, but uh, before we get to introducing him, I'd like to uh, introduce a couple of our groups that will be singing a couple of songs to invite the Lord's presence uh, before we get to the main event. So take it away, singing group. Thank you, brother. Um, brothers and sisters, let's join together and sing the song. All my ways are known to you. In time. 
times of loss and loneliness The rich or poor, your word is true That all my ways are known to you No trial has come beyond your hand No step by walk beyond your plan the path is dark outside my view Still all my ways are known to you And oh, all peace that I have found Wherever I may be For all my ways are known to you Hallelujah, they are known Not fear the final night, for death will be the door to life. You take my hands and lead me through, for all my ways are known to you. And oh, all peace that I brothers and sisters let's sing our next song the servant king Our lives 
as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Come see his hands at his feet, the scars that speak. stars into space to cruel nails this is our God the servant king he calls us now to follow him to bring our lives as a day learn how to serve and in our lives and throne him each other's needs to prefer for it is Christ we're serving this is our God the servant Thank you, Philip, for leading us in those uh, songs and inviting the Lord's presence. All right, without further ado, let me uh, move on to the introduction. It is my absolute privilege, and I don't think I've had any greater privilege in any previous introduction, to introduce my brother, my blood brother, my brother in Christ, uh, Sanjay Poonin. And I'll just give a few words of introduction uh, for him. Probably the least important fact about him, and I'll repeat that, the least important fact, as he would say to me, he, he made sure to tell me to make sure this was not glamorous in terms of introduction, is the fact that he is the CEO of a Silicon Valley company named Cohesity. And the reason that's the least important fact is because he would much rather be known as a child of God and a servant of God and a brother in Christ and one that is committed to building the local body of Christ. He works together closely with me in building our local uh, body of Christ here in our church, uh, New Covenant Christian Fellowship in San Jose. And when I think about Sanjay, I'll just share a couple of things that come to mind that maybe many of you don't know about him because you have heard of him as a public figure, as, uh, as a corporate executive, maybe as a son of Zach Boonin, uh, and many, many of you have heard of him in an uh, extended CFC context as well. Uh, but Sanjay stands out, the verse to me that embodies Sanjay to me is Philippians 2 verse 3, and that is, regard others as more important than yourselves. And I, I can't think of another person that very counterintuitively embodies that more so than Sanjay in terms of treating every single person. Imagine he is the CEO of a large company, uh, thousands of people reporting to him, many people, he's a father at home, he's active in ministry here at the church. But in all of these situations, and many, and certainly many people come to him and treat him with a lot more respect, but in all of these situations, I have seen him. He is an oldest brother to all of his siblings as well. But even in those family situations in the extended family, he has always treated me and everyone else as more important than himself. And that really speaks to his humility. And he is a great example of that. And the other two qualities that I mentioned is 
Uh, he is one of the greatest examples of being a peacemaker. And a peacemaker is one that first sets peace in their own conscience between them and God. And Sanjay is one that is quick when he sees something wrong between him and God, or he's convicted of something from a word he hears, to set it right between him and God. And then beyond that, to bring peace with uh, other human beings where uh, there might be perceived conflict. And then the last thing I'll mention is that he's extremely generous, not just with his money, but with his time. And Proverbs 11.25 says, a generous man will be prosperous, and the man who waters others will himself be watered. And all of us, not all of us may, be, may have a lot of money, but all of us have plenty of time. And I think Sanjay is an amazing example of one who is generous with his time and an example to me and an example to all of us, how we can be generous with our time in spending time with loved ones, with brothers and sisters, encouraging ones in need. And in that sense, he is a trailblazing example. And of course, as you all know, uh, and you may have heard, he is a dynamic, inspirational leader in the workplace, um, a trailblazing example of servant leadership, and has spoken in uh, many ways, inspiring others to follow his example. And to me personally, he has been a role model, for personally, professionally, as well as spiritually. So without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure and joy to introduce to you Sanjay Poonan. Take it away, Sanjay. Thank you, my brother Sunil. And um, I'm honored and humbled. Um, none of the words that you said I deserve. <clears throat> Um, I will tell you, we both owe a lot of that to the Lord, clearly, first off, but I will give my mother a lot of credit. Um, she is my hero in my life, and I think a lot of the humility us boys have learned um, comes from the example we saw of her at home, uh, her from her, I was not born at the time, but my st stories I heard about her serving in a leprosy mission hospital, and also um, the examples I saw of her growing up of treating other people, there was no fame or fortune um, desire in her or desire to treat people in the church setting or in society or in our neighborhood or in our school. Her friends were the people who were the lowly people who served the Lord. And it was no difference. In fact, it, the case was most often that the people who are rich and famous did not want to serve the Lord. It's not the fact that God cannot use rich and famous people. But most often, um, as we see in the scriptures, those who love money, uh, that God is not, uh, you know, that God is mammon. So we're very grateful for examples. And my hope is during the course of this discussion um, and questions that we answer, I can be a small encouragement to you like my mother's been to me. Um, I apologize, my voice is a little hoarse. I'm getting over a cough and a cold, but God will give me grace. Thank you for your prayers. Um, and what I'd like to do today is encourage, especially the young people. Um, it's a tremendous blessing. I'm honored and humbled uh, to have several hundred people on the Zoom, and I think people on YouTube too. And I hope for especially those of you who are in your 20s and your 30s, um, and especially in the workplace, some are called to be in full-time ministry like my dad. My dad supported himself, but he was working for the Lord full-time when he left the Navy. Before that, he was in the Navy. But 98% of us, maybe 99%, maybe all of us will have a job in the workplace. In fact, that's what the disciples had. A few of them quit that job maybe and was supported. But Paul was a tent maker. Peter was a fisherman. Um, Daniel. Job, Joseph, all had jobs, but they found a way to serve the Lord in a way that was remarkable and very inspirational to me. And what I would like to do is to share with you a few of those examples that have been examples in the, the Bible, what has taught me about the, their story, and then use a few of those principles uh, for the first 30, 45 minutes of our discussion and then we can also take some questions that I think Brother Matthew and Sunil are going to facilitate. There are not many examples in the Bible of people who were in the workplace uh, and also people of, of integrity who fear the Lord. But there are a few that really stand out. 
because most often you see them as prophets or you see them as preachers. Uh, we can go back to some of the first examples in the Old Testament. And to me, Joseph is the first example of an incredible man who is probably like many of you here in watching this, in that age group that Joseph was. And, you know, for those of you who are finishing high school, going into college, they tell you your 20s is the most formative years of your life. That first job that you take is the most important because it's going to set you up for whatever you do next. You work so hard in college to get that first job. I don't know if you all know what Joseph was doing in his 20s. Almost his entire 20s, he was in jail. It's a remarkable thing to think about that. Um, and when I think about what could have been going on in his life, I mean, obviously he was sold into slavery, and he was in jail for standing up for integrity when, you know, he could have sinned, done something. We all know what happened is the temptation with part of his wife. Maybe no one would have seen him, but God would have seen it. But for conviction, he stood up in, in, in private where no one was watching, got sent to jail, thought he was going to get taken out of jail because he hoped that someone would remember him. Even that person forgot about him. He was in jail probably for twice as long as maybe expected. But because of his faithfulness uh, to stand true to God, when everybody else was compromising, he stood true to God with conviction. God put him to the place where he was the number two person in the number one country in the world. So whatever country you think is the leading country today in the world, it doesn't matter. Imagine you were the number two person in that country. And you were there for a purpose. The purpose was not to make money. Ultimately, his purpose was to save his people. Because we know there was harvest and then there was famine. And Joseph was able to rescue his family. And maybe that entire clan, you know, Jacob and all that, his children would have died had it not been for Joseph rescuing that family. Of course, they were able to come out later on from Egypt. But the impact of Joseph has had a tremendous, um, you know, has, has strung to my life many times. I think about what he was doing in his 20s and how he served God. Again, what wisdom God gave him through his 20s into his 30s. And what would he have uh, done in a particular situation? How did God give him wisdom over and over again? Before I get to Daniel, another example. Let me cover another example in the Old, Test Old Testament. Job. Imagine that you had, not that any of this matters in today's day and age, but imagine that you had everything that you needed. Okay, he was, if you look at all of the possessions of Job, it counts cattle and, you know, obviously number of children. And today, if you count all of that, it's probably like cars and houses and whatever have you. So in worldly material terms, God had blessed him. But then one day, all of that disappeared. And he gets covered with boils. He's sent out to the city. And even his wife basically says, you should curse God and die. So everybody's rejected him. And even these people who are so-called Christian friends of his, or godly friends of his, people who um, were supposedly supposed to come and help him, they were not really comforting him. And through all of that, he finds an even closer relationship with God. Now, at the end of the story, God restores much of that. But we know in the New Testament, many people, you know, were sent to the stake to, to be burned, and God didn't rescue them. And our evidence of God's blessing isn't in the New Testament material anymore. The point is through our... Uh, Life's journeys where we go through ups and downs. All of us will have valleys and we will have mountaintops. The key is to find God in the valleys. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, My, um, you may think when you look at my career and things of those times, it's up and to the right. But I will tell you that my walk with the Lord has been the closest when I have had to go through points in life where it felt like a valley. Maybe there was something that was besetting me. It was really seeking to bring me down, or maybe there was a time when I wasn't um, close to the Lord. As many of you knew, I grew up as um, <clears throat> the son of Zach Poonin. And for many years, I resented that. Um, or maybe till I was 18, 
I was because I was under the this sort of bright flashlight of everybody watching every move I made in the church. People wanting to know if my move to the left to the right. Why was he doing this? And many of my brothers were probably in the same way. I see many of you smiling and laughing on Zoom. You may know what it's like if you are a pastor's, a preacher's son. Imagine the scrutiny you're under. So I resented that. I wanted to be not known as Zach Moonen's son. I wanted to be my own person who could do what I want to do. Not, I don't think I had a desire to be a prodigal son, but I just didn't want the, the light and the scrutiny. Um, when the Lord opened this door for me to get a scholarship to come as an immigrant here to this country, um, for the first few years, I was extremely lonely. I was homesick because, oh my gosh, now I was so far away. No one at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, where I came to, had never been to New Hampshire. <laughs> for those of you who are in New England, in the northeast part of the United States, dialed into the Zoom, you know how cold it is in the Boston area. It's remarkably different from Bangalore. I was homesick. I was lonely. And then I wanted to be Zach Poon and son because I wanted to be back at home. How remarkable things had changed. But when I was so far away from home, 10,000 miles, missing my family, I felt a little bit like what Joseph or Job or Daniel, many of these folks who were away from their families must have fed. And I said, now I had to experience God for myself. Many of you were at the previous um, <clears throat> Zoom session, which Brother Sunil spoke at mostly towards younger teenagers and 20 something but he said something that struck me even as an older person. He said, God has no grandchildren. He only has children. Okay, so what does that mean to me? Well, okay, Zach Poonin is a son of the Lord. I don't get to be a grandchild of Jesus just because I'm the son of Zach Poonin. God has no grandchildren. I have to enter that proverbial kingdom through the eye of the needle myself. And I found that for myself in my late teenage years and my 20-somethings when all of a sudden I had to enter the kingdom not on the coattails of Zach Poonin because I committed my life to Jesus because I stood up as my own when no one was watching. I had to commit my life. to his. I'd been baptized, but I had to rededicate my life in my 20s. And that for me was a remarkable. I had to probably leave home, uh, experience the, the homesickness, the loneliness, away from my family. Many of you who have come to the United States have come here or have left home in your late mid to late 20s. So for me, all of these examples of what I saw in the Old Testament had a very formative experience in my life. As I Now let's get to Daniel. Daniel's one of my greatest heroes. Daniel um, uh, was, you know, think of him in, in his late teenage years, in fact, many times I've talked about the subject. I've called it Dare to be a Daniel. Um, imagine you're in your 18, sort of similar age to when I came to this country. Um, and you're offered, you know, food and you have a conviction that you're not going to eat the food that's offered to idols. You're not going to drink the wine. Um, you're instead going to eat vegetables and drink water. And the end of that first part, there's so many aspects of Daniel that are so inspiring. But the part of the first part of that story in Daniel 1 and 2 that's so remarkable is they give him a test at the end of the, the you know, that first sequence uh, of his being selected. And it says he's, I don't know, three or five or seven times smarter than everybody else. And I got to tell you, I have always been inspired by people who, Serve the Lord. I had examples in my growing up years in Bangalore of brothers who would come to the meetings on a Wednesday night, even though they had a major exam the next day. Uh, or they'd come on a Sunday um, for the meeting, and I knew they had a major exam on Monday. And in their own small way, they were trying to say, Lord, I'm going to prioritize you first. And I've always prayed, Lord, if I'm going to be faithful to you like Daniel, um, I'm not going to pray, make me seven or ten times smarter than everybody else, but maybe me, make me seven or ten times more productive. And many of us, when we face challenges in the workplace, many of the things that we face are puzzles. Should we do this? Should we do that? It's a decision in front of us, uh, or we have a problem that's being asked by our manager to get solved. Imagine if what it takes you one hour to solve, 
It takes everybody else 10 hours to solve because God's given you that supernatural power and that wisdom. Imagine, you know, the same wisdom that allowed Daniel to discover a dream. Imagine being asked by your boss, I had a dream yesterday. If you don't tell me what that dream was, I'll put you in jail. I mean, that's an impossible request. But that's in, sense, in some senses what the assignment Daniel was given. And God gave him an incredible amount of wisdom. And that's the wisdom I prayed for every day when I face a puzzle at work. Lord, give me the wisdom. Give me the productivity of Daniel. I'm going to honor you. 1 Samuel 2.30, those who honor you, I will honor. And hold on to that, brothers and sisters, when you're faced in the workplace with challenges. And I'm here, the God of Daniel is still true today. Some of the things may not be, you may not get the promotion, but there's many times where somehow I'm working on a particular project and there's a breakthrough uh, or there's an idea that comes through. And that's an answer to prayer. And then go back and say, Lord, thank you. I was faithful to you. Um, thank you for giving me that extra piece of wisdom. And then the amazing part of the Daniel story, a few times during this discussion today, I'm going to flash a few screens up so you can see pictures too, in addition to um, my words. The beautiful aspect of this picture, which is Daniel's three friends, we know their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why is Daniel not in this picture? So Daniel was not there. Maybe he was on a business trip. In this part of the story, we don't hear about Daniel. Daniel's gone, but his conviction and his desire to be faithful had inspired these three men. So often, brothers and sisters, you will be an inspiration to those who are younger than you by simply following the Lord. And here, now they are tested on their own without Daniel now. And whatever that temptation is today in terms of bowing down to an idol, we're all going to be faced this. And all of our surrounding friends, all the other Jewish brothers of his were all bowing down. This is an example to me of Christians who are compromising left, right, and center today in the workplace. And you, three of you who are Christians, brothers and sisters, you stand um, for conviction while everybody else is compromising. And you get thrown into the fire like these three men did. You get persecuted in the workplace. But there in the middle of that fire, they, they meet Jesus, as we know, the Son of God. And the amazing thing about this fire, I've shared this a number of times. It's worth repeating again, though. It, they were bound with ropes and sent into the fire, it says in the story. Yet when they came out of the fire, they smelt their hands and there was no smell of um, fire on their hair of their hands, it says. But their ropes were burned away. How is that possible? Ropes and hair are made of the same material. The ropes burned away, yet their, their skin did not even smell of fire. To me, that's an incredible uh, inspiration and a blessing. And a um, to me, when the Lord takes us to a trial, imagine to be freed of everything that's binding us. That's what ropes are. It binds us here to this earth. But at the same time, we're not going to be touched at all. And you can hold on to that promise, brothers and sisters. If there's something that's binding you, maybe it's discouragement, maybe it's something else, God will free you from that in the midst of your trial. Yet, no one will be able to touch you uh, on this earth. Even if they take your life, that's the worst case. None of us have had that happen. We're here on this Zoom call. None of us have been killed so far. But maybe down the road, there will be persecution, like the first century Christians. When this happened to many of the first century Christians, they didn't survive this. They died and they went to heaven. So even in the worst case, if God takes us to heaven, it's in a beautiful picture uh, of how you can come through the fire and still be uh, sanctified even further. This picture is a painting that my dad and mom gave me. Um, it's in my office, right above my desk here, where my computer is. And here is Daniel, probably much older, maybe in his 70s, maybe in his 80s. My dad is 84, so maybe he's about that age now. So he's been faithful to God many decades. Um, and now, of course, and the beautiful thing about Daniel's story is he's actually the number two person, like Joseph, in three different administrations. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, and Darius. Think about this. Imagine if you were in a government and three different presidents or prime ministers came to office. Democrat, Republican, Democrat, or maybe, I don't know, BJP, Congress, BJP, whatever have you. And in every one of those administrations, you're still the number two person because they said, I don't care 
but what political affiliations? I want this person. He's the best person to do the job. Or three different CEOs or three different leaders come in. They all want, always want Daniel because he's the best person for the job. That was Daniel over and over again. But in his this time, everyone is is trying to trap him. They trap him because he's faithful and prays in public, not in secret. He prays with his windows open. Another good example of not being ashamed of his faith. Thrown into the lion's den, and we know the rest of the story. Now I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, again, like the Christians of the first century, the lion's mouth was not closed in the first century. Many of them got eaten. So the point of the story is not that when we enter a situation, maybe in the future, the lions then maybe the lions might open their mouth. But the point of the matter, brothers and sisters, is we can be faithful. And that is what inspires me about these three examples. And there's many more in the Old Testament. There's not as many in the New Testament that we see who were examples of Christians in the workplace. But I will tell you the key thing I take away from those three or four I shared with you is be a Christian of conviction in the midst of Christians who are compromising left, right, and center. And if you work through the workplace, I'm not even talking about non-Christians. Non-Christians are compromising all over the place. Okay, They don't have a fear of God often to understand. But it's sad when Christians, so-called Christians, are compromising. And that's what we should all encourage each other to be a Daniel, to be a Joseph, that in the midst of compromise, we stand up for God. And that what we hear on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening on our Bible study, we get to live at work. That's the most important thing. Many of us have heard at these types of sessions, church is not about Sunday morning. It's about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, real life starts on Monday morning when you go to work. And you ask yourself, how are you going to live now? And, and, and you hear something that guides you. One of the things that have blessed me tremendously about these uh, daily devotionals, many of you know the daily devotionals, and I'm very grateful to the CFC team that puts that together. For those of you brothers who put that together, you know, that is my inspiration every morning. I drive to work. It's a half an hour commute. Uh, I turn on the daily devotional, and it blesses me. It's, uh, now my kids, they're able to go to school. It takes about 15, 20 minutes. It blesses them. But some small word is going to come to you from that daily devotional or what you heard that Sunday that's going to, to guide you and inspire you to be a person of conviction. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit to the modern 20th century and look at some examples of people who are similarly people of conviction. Uh, and I like to use these because these are good examples uh, of people we can follow who may not have been always you know, people in the workplace, but were people of conviction. George Mueller, many of you know this story. To me, he's an incredible person of <clears throat> faith who believe the impossible. And many times in the workplace, I pray, Lord, you know, if it's your will, make the impossible possible. Um, sometimes those prayers work out, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they take a year to work out. I'm working on a deal that might take a long time to work through. There's this problem that is taking twice as long. Lord, make the impossible possible. Imagine that you're taking care of orphans, as he did. There is no food on the table, no milk on the table. And all these orphans are getting together and you say, let's pray in faith that there's going to be food, but there's no food on the table. You pray in the food for, for, for food, and just as you finish saying amen at the end of the prayer, the doorbell rings, and there's a baker whose you know, van is broken down, and there's your bread. And similarly, the milk van shows up. That's probably many times when he didn't get answered to prayer, but we heard about the story where God answered prayer. And whether he answered the prayer and provided us bread or van, the fact of the matter was that here was a man who, example after example, in the late 19th century, was an example of perseverance through faith. Those of you younger men who um, love athletics, Eric Little, you all heard about that story. Um, <clears throat> there was a movie about this also created called Chariots of Fire. Um, Eric Little was an amazing man. Imagine you're 18, okay, and I like to paint these pictures because many of you are probably in that age, and you're an athlete or you're really good, and, and he was so good he could run, win the 100 meters for his country, which was England. Um, and as many of you know, athletes, you have a window of time. 
18 to 22 when you're at the peak. And Olympics only happen once every four years. Turns out the heats, the heat for the 100 meters is on uh, a Sunday. He has a conviction he's not going to run on a Sunday. He goes to his coach and says, coach, I'm not going to run the 100 meters now. And he says, the coach is laughing at him. Are you kidding me? How could you do this? You're representing the country. Why don't you go to church on a Saturday and then run on a Sunday? Um, and he is resolute about his conviction. Why? I mean, your God can, you can worship your God on Saturday too. Anyway, he misses the heat. Um, fortunately, the English team accommodates him in the 400 meters. One of the other English athletes gives up this spot. He's never run the 400 meters. He gets the final, um, you know, starting blocks of the 400 meters. And this American athlete comes to him with a piece of paper and gives him this piece of paper. On the piece of paper is this verse, 1 Samuel 2.30. <clears throat> those who honor God, those who honor me, I will honor. It's a beautiful verse. I talked about it earlier. Um, this, the conviction of Eric Little had, had an impact on this other um, athlete who was also a Christian running. It turns out he wins the 400 meters. He goes on, he could have won another Olympics, but he goes on to be a missionary in China. And as the story goes later on, he held races for many of the prisoners. He was in prison uh, in China as a missionary in his later years. He would hold races for many of the folks uh, in the prison that he was on a Sunday. So he wasn't a legalist about that. He maybe, maybe in his later years, he felt it's totally okay for me to serve the Lord. I don't have a conviction to run myself. But I'm going to serve you, and if I'm going to run races in the prison here on a Sunday, that's totally okay. He didn't live very long. He died of cancer, brain cancer, at 43 years old. Amazing example of someone. Okay, God doesn't just use brothers. He uses sisters too. Amy Carmichael, an incredible woman of God who served in India, my home country, in the early 20th century. And many of the folks who were involved in the orphanages, and have seen the impact she had in India. Tremendous service of humility and servant leadership. So there's examples and examples after of this kind, brothers and sisters, that are incredible examples to me. Um, and these are the types of stories uh, in Psalms that says, I'll keep the, make the godly my heroes. So the first thing I would encourage each of you to do is pick a godly example that you can personalize. Personalize, study their example, because there are other examples today, certainly in the world, but the God's given us the Bible for a reason, and there are examples. I gave you a few, some who were in the Bible, some who were not. Read their biographies. If they are certainly in the Bible, you get to read them. But if they're not, um, they've lived more recently, read their biographies and ask yourself, how can I emulate their life in their godly example? To me, it was tremendously impactful because many of these stories um, you know, helped me in my early years um, and then ask yourself, Lord, there's somebody in the workplace that I'd like to see as an encouragement. And God was able to give me um, often other Christians in the workplace. Um, because, you know, for me, many of the people I would see in the church um, were older than me. And I didn't have examples often in the country I was living in. I had to look for other Christians. Um, and I found that that. Just being, for example, in a Bible study with others, they may not have light on everything we have. They may not go to the same in church and have light on everything, but they are seeking to live uh, for the Lord. Find a way by which you can plug in um, to others who are in trying to be a Christian to work with and encourage them. And then somewhere in my 30s, I would say, um, I mean, the Lord blessed me with the... Now, more and more success in my career, and I was starting to rise in my career at uh, SAP um, and later on at VMware. And for me, then um, I began to ask the Lord, Lord, I need to write down what are some of the goals and values and missions I have for my life. And it, maybe if I write that down, it could be an inspiration to others. Because I want to live by godly values. See, everybody in the world wants to live by a goal. I want to be, I don't know, some wealth level or stature level. or And none of this, the first thing that really needs to grip us is none of the things that the world has to offer us, we can take to the grave and matter at all if the Lord comes. It's all going to be 
um, you know, hay and rubble and going to be burned up. But that's not the value system of the world. I mean, you're surrounded and many of you are talented. You have the ability to, to pursue potentially a dream. Should we do that? There's tension. Should we pursue um, success at the workplace? So I began to write down some of my top 10, I would say, values that I wanted to live by. I did this about 20 years ago, okay? In the, I don't know, two, circa 2004, 2005. And it was as my career was starting to grow uh, in my years at, early years at SAP. And those 10 have not changed. And I want to read them to you now one at a time. Many of you have heard me talk about this before. And the good news is it's a little bit to me like the Bible. The 10 commandments haven't changed. I mean, many stories haven't changed. And I go back often and refresh myself on these 10 values. And often because they're now on the internet and on YouTube, I will get LinkedIn messages from friends of mine saying, I was so inspired by principle number three or principle number four. So I'm not here to share these to you, with you like their 10 commandments or anything of those kind. They have helped me live my own life with conviction in a time when everyone's, like I said, compromising. And I share them with you a tremendous amount of humility. Like I said, my goal in life, and I'm very honored that Sunil shared that. I'll say one thing before I say what I'm about to say. You know, I grew up the oldest of four boys. <clears throat> and, you know, I was the oldest brother, four years, roughly about four years older than my second brother, Satosh, five years older than my uh, third brother, Sandeep, and then about nine years older than Sunil. And, you know, I like to be the boss in the home because I was the oldest. And, you know, uh, when you're young, you can beat them at sports and all that stuff. And then at some point, and that changes. And you get into your teenagers and your 20s. For those of you who are in a similar situation now, it's all equal when you're in your 20s. Uh, and then they get better than you at something or the other, most often sports. Um, but I will tell you, it's amazing to me now in my 50s, I can follow their example. I genuinely mean that. And I look up to them as godly examples. All three of them, they're elders in two of them in uh, my church here in San Jose, NCCF, the other brother in Colorado. They are godly examples to me. Uh, I'm, you know, and, and to me, um, that is amazing. Uh, because the Lord has blessed them in their walk with the Lord. Um, and I love being able to follow them. And when we can say to others, follow me as we follow Christ, and there is no respecter of age. And I've always believed, it does, I mean, Sunil was gracious. He gave me the titles. Many of you know my education degrees. All of that means nothing. When I come into church, whether it's the physical gathering on a Sunday afternoon, like we have, or a Tuesday night, Every one of my earthly crowns needs to be left outside the door. If I come in with any attitude that I am a CEO or I'm educated in this institution, God can't use me. Um, I need to come in as the humblest, the lowest, um, in the least of the kingdom of God, because that's the example Paul had. As he got more and more mature, he was calling himself the worst of sinners. And as you see his life, when he goes from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60, whenever, maybe in his 50s before he was killed, he was calling himself more and more, Lord, thank you, I'm the worst of all. Of all. So um, as I share this, um, I wrote this because I wanted these values to be ones that live with me for forever. So I'm going to flash these up one at a time very quickly with you, and hopefully they can be an inspiration to all of you. We'll run through them fairly quickly. Now, you're welcome to, I mean, these are all on the web. But I would encourage you, I'm not going to go through all of the verses here. But if you can, write down some of these verses or snapshot these verses here because the verses are really, I think to me, the great inspiration. All of these are based on scriptural verses. Okay, number one, <clears throat> really important for us to realize that our life on this earth is like vapor. And our true citizenship is not at the workplace I am. I'm at SAP or VMware or Covisti. My citizenship is in heaven. And everything that I seek to gain on this earth is going to evaporate. My life is going to evaporate too. I've had friends of mine who are in their 40s. I was in my 40s. They were in their 40s. One day they got a heart attack and died. I've had friends, and I'm now in my 50s, who suddenly 
heart attack and died. They're having lunch. Some folks younger than me collapsed and died. We don't know when a time on this earth is done. But if you knew that your time on earth was going to come tomorrow, either the Lord is going to come back or you're... And often with cancer, we know the end of our time. Okay, there was a there time when you get to prepare for that, but sometimes we don't. But if you knew that you had your end of your life was tomorrow, what would you do today? Would you seek to go and get that big goal or the big deal or make more money or that next big promotion? Or hopefully you're, you're set everything right and um, you're ready to meet your, your, your Savior. So I reminded by this and all of the scripture verses here at the bottom of this, talk to your citizenship is in heaven. Never forget that young brother and sister who is working in the workplace. If God gives you some reward, that's good. But nothing I've accomplished on this earth, nothing any of us accomplished on this earth matters at all. Okay, number two. Work hard in everything we do. It's really important. I often find, you know, um, Christians, some Christians, they don't work as hard. You know, Proverbs says, go to the ant, you sluggard, and learn from the ant. It, we need to be examples of the most hardworking people on this earth. Not, I mean, it doesn't have to be workaholics, but people who work really hard. When someone asks us to do something, we do it thoroughly. But then when you work hard and the Lord grants you success, fall on your knees with humility and say, Lord, help me to be faithful because at that time when people recognize me, and the Lord, people have recognized me in the last 20 years because that is the time I'm going to get proud. And that is the time I'm going to be tempted to not be faithful. Lord, give me grace at that time to be faithful. And you know what's amazing? In my own life, I have found the Lord has given me good doses of success and failure. Success and failure. And, and not failure in a way that's, you know, hopefully not failure ever for reasons of, of malpractice or things that are egregious sin or things, those kinds. But, you know, sometimes I'm not picked for the next job. Or something I'm working on doesn't happen. I'm working on a deal. I lose that deal to a competitor. I mean, some, well, failure in the sense of what you might consider failure in the workplace. Um, but what I've said, Lord, in whether it's success or failure, I always want to be humble for you. Right, number three, I will be a light on a hill, salt and food, keeping my Christian behavior excellent so others can glorify God. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is three of my favorite chapters, Sermon on the Mount, because you can read that over and over again. The entire Sermon on the Mount is like 15, 17 minutes. It's like they call a TED Talk is 17 minutes. If you read it end to end or imagine Jesus preaching it, it's like a 17-minute TED Talk. I'd encourage you to listen to it over and over again. And there's so many verses in that that are packed with relevance and practicality for a Christian in the workplace. One of them is this. And this picture is beautiful, right? What's a light on a hill? Very visible. Somebody who wears a, maybe a button on their, their shirt that says, Jesus saves. Praise God for those brothers and sisters who are bold. What is salt and food? It's not visible. But you can taste it. They sit down with you. They're quiet. Maybe it's a sister who is not as bold. But when you sit down with her, you're super encouraged and you know she's godly. That's my mother, for example. But in either case, whether you're vocal and you're visible or you're more invisible, Keep your Christian behavior excellent so that others can glorify God. That's Matthew 5, 3, 16 to 17. Okay, number four. So many of the decisions we have to make every day are do I turn left or right? It's not about sin or non-sin. Should I do this? Should I not do that? Which way should I go? And very often I say, Lord, fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, first off, to overcome sin. That's the most important thing. But... Do you think the Holy Spirit can also guide you the way they, the, the God guided Daniel and Joseph? Absolutely. And Lord, what should I say in this particular situation? Or what should I say? I'm being asked to give a speech here. And amazingly, while I'm just standing up there, something goes in my head. Say this. And somebody in the audience is blessed. That was from the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that wisdom to say exactly that word. And it was nothing to do about being a Christian or godliness. It was about some way in which I could think of a metaphor or an example. And every time someone comes up to you and says, wow, what you said there was the right thing we needed to hear about uh, in this particular situation. Go and give, say, Lord, thank you. That was the Holy Spirit giving me wisdom. 
uh, and, and most often, it's about how we speak and how we act. Often in the workplace, people are judged by how we speak and how we act. Number five, generosity. How should we deal with generosity? Most often, <clears throat> people talk about this in the context of money. You got to give money. You got to give money. You got to give money. And the Christian the churches are filled with, you must tithe. And if you don't tithe, God's not going to bless you in the workplace. Um, I don't believe that at all. Um, certainly, you know, if God gives, given you more of, of treasure, I call time, talent, and treasure, the three T's that we can give treasure is money. Use it and do it in confidence. Do it in a way that no one knows about. Don't do it in a way where everyone hears about it. So many people want to be philanthropists in a big way. Do it in a way where no one hears about it. And if you're, you, if somebody knows that it's you, please ask them to keep it confidential. That's related to the treasure, it's money. Where so much about money giving is about what people want to get a name for. But I will tell you something that all of you can give, your time and your talent. Okay, That time, all of us have. Talent, all of us have different degrees of it. You might be gifted in, in music like the brothers who led this morning. Give up that talent to the Lord and be generous. And I will tell you, the Lord will reward you. One of those places will be like the wisdom of Daniel to discover dreams and so on. Number six, this is a tough one. How could we be ambitious in the workplace um, and ambitious to get to the top, the top of where it is? You know, many of the people who knew my dad in the Navy later on, I would meet people who were classmates of my dad in the Navy or who were retired. You would tell me, I don't know why your dad left the Navy. Had he stayed in the Navy, he would have been the Admiral of the Navy. Okay. And I always ask myself, my dad was, he could have been ambitious and could have been the Admiral of the Navy. I'm sure when he was in the Navy, he wanted to be that. There was nothing wrong with that. He chose to leave that and serve the Lord. But is it wrong if you're in the Navy or if in my workplace and God's given you the gift uh, for you to rise? I'm now the CEO of my company. I couldn't do that without any ambition. The point here is selfish ambition. If I'm doing it purely for myself, and often selfish ambition is manifest in the workplace where people climb over each other. And the workplace is filled with people who are political, who want to step over each other to get to the top um, or undermine others. Because in undermining somebody else, you're able to say that I'm better. That's an example. Now, the same time if the Lord doesn't take you to the top, that's totally okay. Your real ambition should be to serve the Lord. And I will tell you, if I wasn't the CEO of Cohesity, the bigger aspect of what I want to be by motivated by every day is, Lord, is am I on fire for you? First, that's my personal life. Is my married life, Kathy and me, are we on fire for you? Then the family life, Sophia, Alex, Jason, my children, are they on fire for you? That's the personal context. It means nothing if I'm successful at Cohesity, if my family's not on fire for you. I better quit my job and, and handle my family matters rather than aspire to anything in the workplace. And it's sad often when people have chased all of their ambitions in the workplace and their family has no time, they have no time for their family. Or in church, how can I serve the Lord? I may not be able to do everything because sometimes I've got to travel for business, but where is my heart? Okay, where your heart is, um, there is also where your love will be. That's why you cannot love God and love mammon. You have to set yourself on loving God. Now, in the context of that, if the Lord allows you with the pursuit of a goal to get to a particular um, career, God bless you for that, but do nothing out of selfish ambition. Okay, number seven. We're getting to the close of this. I'm trying to finish this at the top of the hour so that we can then take some questions in the second hour. So thank you for your patience as we finish, almost finished with the, the last three or four. Number seven, I, people, uh, the brother Matthew asked me, how do you want to be introduced for this meeting? And I said, I want to be called an aspiring servant leader. I always feel like that's my goal. Lord, make me more and more a servant leader. Um, and because I'm going to show you a picture in a second, uh, I think the picture that I've shown, in fact, in the workplace and physically at work, many of these, these top 10 I don't share in the workplace because I'm not trying to, you know, make, my my role at a company like a pastor's role where I'm preaching to people. But I talk about being a servant leader in the workplace. Why? It's super important for people to know 
that I'm not the CEO bird sitting at the top of a tree. I'll show you a picture in a second. But part of the reason is because I'm inspired by this person. This is the picture of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. So if that is the person I serve, this shouldn't be the picture of how I manage the workplace. So in, at Cohesity, I'm at the top here. And most often, this is a picture of how people look at the workplace. That poor bird that's sitting at the, the lowest leaf level, as they call it, the organization. Maybe they call them individual contributors. Okay, then there's a manager, then there's a director, then there's a VP, then there's a CEO often. Often, all the, the individual contributors see is when they look up is bird poop coming down them. You go do this. It's a command and control style of how the people lead. This is the army. In the army, it's command and control. You better told, get told what to do. I often tell my people, this is how I want to lead. Okay? Where the CEO is the bottom of the pyramid. And if you're an engineer or a sales rep, I serve you. Now, where do you think I got this from? It's a fashionable idea now. People can say it's Gandhian. I got this from this person. Jesus served that way. And if we can be a servant leader, I will tell you, it's, a, it's, it's so much better to serve and to get joy out of giving and joy out of seeing other people successful. Um, and you discover it's a lot more blessed to give um, and not to celebrate. There's so many people I find in the workplace who want to seek um, you know, glory for themselves. They have to get the honor themselves. And when they're under pe people who work for them, get recognized, they're very jealous of that. Sometimes I notice in the workplace, you have a, uh, an individual contributor, a manager, and, and then let's say you know, the director above that. When the individual contributor is visible to the director, okay? Uh, individual contributor, manager, or director. When the individual contributor gets recognized for something, the manager is jealous. And I often ask that manager, imagine you were a parent, okay? This is an example that I use in the workplace. Imagine you were a parent, and I used to run when I was young with my kids. Now many of them can race me out. But when I was young, I could beat them in a race, 50 meters, 100 meters, whatever have you. One day, they got faster than me. Do you think that day when they got faster than me, I was jealous? No, I want to try and still beat them. But I'm proud of them when they get faster than me. Why is it that manager is jealous of the individual contributor when the individual contributor is shining in front of the director? Because they're insecure and they've not understood. Okay. Quite frankly, this is today, even in modern management terms, a fashionable thing to allow people at the bottom of the, of the pyramid, the people who are the individual contributors shine. Why often most of these people are the people who are serving customers and partners. So whether you believe this is fashionable or not today in modern management, okay, I will tell you, it's biblical. And when you serve God and become a servant leader, not seeking your own glory, but encouraging those around you constantly. You know, when I was, uh, when, I, when we would read bedtime stories to our kids, one of the books we had as bedtime stories was a book called The Giving Tree. And it's always stuck in me. Uh, those of you who like bedtime stories, you should get that book for your kids. It's about a tree that it started off as a seed, then became a little plant. Then as it became a plant, it started to have fruit. But it, as it got bigger, it found that people were just plucking things off it. Plant, I mean, fruit, people pluck off it. It got bigger, people pluck its trees. It got bigger, but it said, okay, I'm just going to give. I'm just going to give. I'm going to give. I'm going to give. Finally, it gets really big. No more, no more fruit to be had, just branches. People start cutting off the branches. Then people cut, cutting off more and more for firewood. Ultimately, all that's left is the stump of the tree. Okay? But even then, the tree says, you know what? Now this is a place where people can sit on. So many generations of people died. Uh, as the book goes, to, the story goes on to tell but people would come and still sit on the trunk of that tree. All that was left of the tree was the trunk. But even in that final form, it was given. And I thought that's a beautiful story of life. In some sense, imagine if our entire life could be about serving and encouraging and serving and encouraging beautiful things. Okay, number eight. I will always be careful my words and build on building a seven, seek to be an encourager. To me, what's beautiful 
about 1 Corinthians 14, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, one of the great gifts it says, it says is, I wish that all of you would prophesy. And when we think of prophecy, we think about foretelling the future. Okay? That's what most people think. Oh, I prophesied on you, which means I'm going to tell you what you're going to do in the future. Actually, if you look at the definition of, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, 2, and 3, it talks about being an encourager and an exhorter. Okay? Uh, and it, it, that's what we need to be able to do. And if you can do those simple things about being an encourager, you're prophesying. All of us can be an encourager. I'm, I don't have time to show this video, but you've all seen this video of the Brownlee brothers. And it means a beautiful picture. When I first saw this, I think it was my brother Sandeep who introduced me to this video. I thought this is a picture of the, the Christian walk, certainly. You know, often there's another Christian brother who wants to come to me. There have been countless brothers in my life from my teenagers who come alongside me. Sadly, some of those brothers who were impactful to me in my teenagers are not even in the church anymore. Some of them, are not, I don't know if they're Christians, but they walked with me and encouraged me as a teenager in my 20s, in my 30s. Now, many of them are walking with me in my 50s. I have to do the same to somebody else. But imagine if you could be like this in the workplace too, where you could be an encourager to someone else. Um, I often joke that my title I'm the CEO of Koisli. I need to be the chief encouraging officer of the company, the chief encouragement officer of the company. And that's a good, you come into work and you're looking for people to encourage. Okay, number nine, I will seek to make the godly my heroes, seeking their counsel frequently. So I talked about going to my brothers, Santosh, Sandeep, and Sunil. I often ask for their advice. How should I do this? What do you think about that? Now they are my peers. They're they're walking ahead of me often in the, in, in the walk with the Lord. I ask my dad. I ask others. It does, there's no respecter of age. Seek those who are godly. You can ask them to pray for you. What do you think I should do here? What, always look for those who have walked with the Lord and make them your heroes. Many of them will be examples like I started my discussion with Daniel and Joseph and Job and uh, Mueller or, uh, and, and Eric Little and so on and so forth or Amy Carmichael, but many of them will be walking with you day to day. And number 10, probably the most important, brothers and sisters, is probably a good one to end on. Always be on fire for God. I don't know, maybe it's the way I'm born because I'm Zach Poon and son. I have not known any other gear in my life than to go fast and to go passionately. I think my dad is that way. Maybe I, I inherited it from him. So when people know me in the workplace, they're like, man, you're always on fire. You're always passionate. You always want to go win. I said, yeah, you know, that maybe is part of who I am. But I want internally for people to know that's good to be on fire. I'm very, you know, aggressive and want to win. People who work with me in the workplace know I want to beat the competition. I want to win. That's okay. But the more important fire is to be on fire for God. And then, of course, that the fire in God allows you to be excited and to be passionate about your work. And to do well in the workplace, that's great. But don't be on fire for the workplace to beat the competition and win and to get to number one in market share, whatever it is, but not be on fire for God. Okay, that's that to me is not being a Daniel. But the Lord can give you a fire for God and to be a change agent in your home, in the church. That can also influence you. One of the things that's been a tremendous inspiration to me in all the jobs that I've God's given me wisdom to be a change agent, to take something, you know, that's been uh, sort of a quasi successful strategy and turbocharge it. Uh, I've been blessed with ideas, both at Cohesity, VMware and SAP, the last three jobs I've had. But I've always told myself when people say, oh, that was incredible, the way you've done this. I tell myself, Lord, what's more important, that success there or is it being on fire for you uh, in, in my godly life? That's more important. Because none of the successes that we have, brothers and sisters, on this earth will last. What will last is being on fire for God. And the character we leave behind, if we have left back a generation that's on fire for God and our children, okay, that's the most important thing. None of the, the successes we have in this workplace matter at all. And I will tell you here, if you don't have successes, many of you are struggling, maybe we're looking for a job. Uh, and you look at someone in my career and say, oh, I'm never going to be. That doesn't matter. If you can be a, a, a brother in the church, it doesn't matter what your jo job is. And um, the Lord will provide for you. 
Uh, when you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. So maybe with that, um, we can pause and bring back Brother Matthew and Brother Sunil. I hope I didn't take more time than you asked me to. Uh, happy to spend the remainder of whatever time we have answering some of the questions. I hope it was a blessing to those who are listening. Yes, thank you, Sanjay, for that excellent message. Uh, very well timed. And uh, I know we've still got plenty of time uh, for the next 45, 50 minutes to cover some of the questions. Uh, and praise God for giving you utterance despite your uh, recent illness and the horse voice and that in itself is an example of sacrifice and serving us and so we praise God and pray that he continues to heal you. We'll take a small break to hear a song um, so sort of singing group number three can come on and uh, sing and then we'll move on to the Q&A session. Jesus, be the center, be my source, be my light, Jesus, Jesus, be the center. Chetan and Jerusha. Um, okay, we can move forward. Uh, actually, before we bring up the questions, just a reminder for folks on Zoom, we'd love to, we'll have some time at the end, uh, to, uh, informal time to for you to greet Sanjay and to uh, greet others on this call. So if you don't mind adding your location, uh, city and country on to your Zoom name, you can just click on the participants tab, click on your name and go to rename and add your location and country. That'll help us know, uh, get to know you and know where you're from. All right, so we can move on uh, to the Q&A time and just an announcement as we bring up the Q&A time, if uh, Brother Jason does, if you don't mind bringing that up. Um, we have 
taken all of the questions that have been uh, uh, raised online uh, over the last week or two as we've advertised it. We've condensed them um, and just sort of trimmed down some duplicates. There are some that might be left out, but we intend to answer all of those offline as well. So that will be published separately on one of our CFC websites or sent out via email. So stay tuned in case your question you feel has not been answered, I'll pay attention to that. But most of them we've been able to address through condensing it. So let's go, uh, Sanjay, if you're ready and yeah. you come back on. Um, we, can, yeah. uh, we have about uh, maybe three minutes, uh, three or four minutes per question and we can try and get as, as many as possible. Yeah. The first four or five are sort of broader and then we'll get to some more tactical ones. So maybe we can go to question number one and question number two together because they're both related. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, the first question says, we can move on to the, to the next slide. Uh, Brother Jason, are you able to advance the slides? Okay, let me uh, try and do this from here then if they're having a problem on their end. Oh, here it is, yeah. Okay, so you can go back up to question one. Slide number two. Yeah. Okay, go. yeah. So, okay, so the first question says, how do I discern if my job and career aspirations have become an idol? How do I discern if I'm spending too much time on work then on God and on family? And the second question is also related. If we can go to the next slide. It is, is it wrong for me to pursue looking for another job when my motive is career aspiration to earn more money and am I serving money? So am I serving mammon? So just a question in terms of how you balance out serving yeah. God versus idolizing your job or career advancement. Yeah. You know, I think these are tough questions. Um, you know, there's often no black and white. I'll tell you some of the ways that I've been guided through this. Um, <clears throat> when I was single, before I was married, um, you know, it was a actually a really good distraction from, um, you know, from other things for me to be, have my first passion uh, other than the Lord uh, be the work rather than, you know, being with friends and things those some signs. So if there was a little bit of workaholism in me, if I could use that term, it actually kept me safe from a lot of other distractions. Um, so now for the question in question one was probably oriented all around also somebody who has a family. And I think that changed, obviously, when I, um, I got married in my 30s. So I would say in my 20s, for those of you in my 20s, um, I think... The, the the you know other than the by my time at, you know that I spent at church or in Bible study or things of those kinds, um, I pursued certainly you know doing the best I could in my career. I would did graduate school, and I think when I look at the time that that took, it took a lot of time. Um, I'm actually grateful that it took a lot of the time because it probably distracted me from other things I might have been doing if I wasn't pursuing education. So I encourage people in their twenties. You know, if if you feel, um, you know, that's not for everybody, but if you feel led to go to graduate school, do it. If you often you can get a scholarship for graduate school because um, it's helpful to you to stay, you know, still I mean, in your 20s and it's the best time to keep learning. It may further a better job for you. Uh, and it's also a very good, you know, distraction away from other things. Um, but once you have a family, those become tougher challenges because, you have to balance work and family. And, you know, I've always thought where your treasure is, that's where your heart will also be, right? And if you treasure your family, um, your heart will be there. And then you have to decide a balance of what is the amount of time. You know, in many of the Silicon Valley jobs, they're not 40-hour jobs. They're 50-hour jobs. But they don't have to always be 80 or 100-hour jobs. Those might be okay in your 20s where you have to work a little harder. And I probably worked some weeks, maybe 80, 90 hours in my uh, 20s. But if I had to keep working in my 30s and 40s, 80, 90 hours, I wouldn't have time for my family. Uh, and it's very then difficult to then say, 
with, with truth, where my treasure is, that's where my heart will also be. So I think those are places where you have to um, make, build, build some boundaries. Um, I had to decide, um, you know, for the number of hours I could work, um, where I draw some boundaries. I've set some, you know, time limits as to, uh, you know, how much, often in a, a job that has sales in it, you have to have dinners with clients. I would often tell my, uh, my staff that, you know, I'm going to try and not do meetings with customers over dinner, but maybe do it lunch because I want to come home for dinner. Um, at some point in time, I would even, I got this idea from one of my uh, friends who was also Christian. I keep a point system, which was the number of times I could be back home uh, for dinner, uh, as opposed to evenings where I had to travel on work. And I wanted to make sure that I was many more points in the green and certainly avoiding travel on the weekend. These are all ways in which you can keep yourself accountable, uh, brothers and sisters, to having a, a very healthy work-life balance. The most important thing, like I said during my earlier comments, is raising a godly family. What will it profit the, a man to gain the whole world, but I would say not just lose his life, lose his family. That to me is, has always lived as a fear of my Lord. I have no success uh, would matter if um, my children are not God-fearing. That's more important. And then good news is I have some members of my family who will keep me accountable. One time I asked my, we have this tradition sometimes on New Year's, they call New Year's resolutions. I would ask my kids, what should dad do better this year? And one of them said, no phone after 6.30 in the evening. Okay, put your phone away. I'm still working on that. Okay, but uh, I've done better. They will speak honestly as to how much they want to see more or less of you. Uh, or, or hopefully it's more, not less. Um, and good news is your children will be honest with you as to what they want more of you. And um, especially men, you know, it's going to be easy sometimes to, to allow these things to get out of balance. So those are a few things I would share, uh, Sunil, that I will, some guidance to folks. But many of these things you have to seek the, the Holy Spirit in specifics here. Thank you, Sanjay. I'm encouraged by your example of even seeking advice from your own children. Again, uh, echoing that idea of serving and learning from them as well. Uh, question number three is, how do you deal with stress and anxiety in a high-risk job with lots of responsibilities? Many, as, as the world has advanced and technology has become more prevalent in a lot of the jobs, things are really driven by high production, high stress, high anxiety, and this is a struggle for many of us as believers. Go ahead. You know, I, I, I fully, this is probably the biggest thing that a lot of people share with me, which is, um, it's not right or wrong or sin. I'm dealing with stress. And, um, you know, I've always asked myself, what's the worst thing that could happen to me um, <clears throat> when I fail at something? Maybe I don't accomplish something. Okay, I could get fired. Hopefully I don't get fired because of malpractice, meaning I was doing something illegal or something that's wrong. I mean, like you hear of these stories, that should never happen. That's sin. But, you know, I've been in, you know, early in the 2000s, uh, my, I was working at a particular company, the CEO didn't like me, decided he wanted somebody else, I got fired. These things happen, and, and we, it teaches us empathy with others who are going to go through that same situation. So I've always walked into work every day, okay, what's the worst case that it's going to happen? If that's the worst case, I still have the Lord. I'm not in, I mean, in prison of being fired, I'm burned, so people in the Bible have had worse than me, Daniel. I still have a family that loves me. I still have a church that loves me. Okay, so I'm going to hunker down and, and find those spaces. Everything else is upside from that. So it's a mosquito bite. Lord, give me then. So I start with the worst of what could it be, right, that I have to go through if I don't accomplish what I call. And then I say, Lord, the God of, of Daniel is going to be here. If you made Daniel, like I said, seven or ten times smarter or more productive, put whatever word you want in there. Lord, help me in this situation. Because usually stress is because you're under pressure on time. I need to get this done by tomorrow. Or I need to get this done in 10 hours. Well, why don't you pray, Lord, the God of Daniel, you can be here to help me get done in one hour what's going to take 10 hours. Do you believe that prayer, brother and sister? Absolutely, I believe that. And I can tell you there's been a number of times where supernaturally I get some idea. 
and I'm staying up. It's it's a project that's going to take me a few hours in the night. I've got to put my kids to bed. And then after that, and amazingly, by like 9, 10 o'clock, I'm done. Okay, 11 o'clock, midnight, I'm done. I don't have to stay up till 3 or 4 in the, in the morning. So um, I would say that that's my testimony. Um, I, I would say as I've grown older, the ability to deal with stress has actually gotten better. And um, um, I would encourage all of you, um, you know, my dad has said, make discouragement a no entry street. It's really struck with me, those words. You know, many streets you see, there's a sign that says, do not enter. We should not let discouragement and depression and anxiety be a, it should be a no entry street for us. Lord, I'm not going to let that go down. I'm not going to go down that street. So pull me back. Use the power of the Holy Spirit or a brother or sister to come alongside me to encourage me. Sometimes when you're going through that, find another brother or sister who can come alongside you. Share with them the challenge you're going through. Often people are sharing with me their challenges, and that's a small way in which I can be an encouragement to you. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that with others in the body of Christ. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, we can move on to the next question. Uh, question number four uh, says, how do you stay humble and serving in the workplace yet not be taken advantage by peers and management? And how do I create visibility for myself without being boastful? So this is um, one that's Many have, uh, yeah. this is one of the more popular questions, this dichotomy of being able to have this servant attitude in the workplace with humility, but yet at the same time, I want to advance in the workplace and be well known for my work. And how do you strike that balance? Yeah. This is, a, this is also a tough one. Um, <clears throat> I'll share with you um, a couple of perspectives. Um, <clears throat> I think when people sense and smell from us, me, my, I, I did this, this is mine, this is me, a lot of I, me, my, I, you know, kind of, that, you know, ultimately um, is self-puffing up and arrogance. I encourage people to always look at success in a mirror, Sorry, success in a window and failure in a mirror. Let me repeat what I said. Look at failure in a mirror and say, if my, and often it's not me, it's my team. My team failed, it's me. There's something that we could have done better and you reflect responsibility up at the top. But when there's success reflected in your team and give them the credit. Now, of course, it's your team. And of course, you know, but um, as you get more responsibility, when you do that, Naturally, people are going to know hey, this team wouldn't be there together if it wasn't you as the top of this group or whatever have you. But it's a very healthy way for your team to also realize this is not about you anymore. Right? And I will tell you, the more that you get responsibility as, as an individual contributor, these I need to shine kind of questions arise a lot. But as you become a manager and maybe a, a next level of director or a vice president or whatever have you, Find people in your team that you can recognize. And clearly, you know, if you hire people who are better than you, I've always said hire people who are better than you. It makes your job easier. I'm not threatened by somebody who's better than me. I want them. I've had, hired many people who want my job. They tell me I'm joining because I want my job. I said, great. It's awesome. I want people like that. I'm not threatened by that. So if you've hired people like that, obviously, if they're not, you want to encourage them not to be stomping over each other. It's a fantastic thing to give credit to people on your team. That's one of the ways in which you can diffuse having it all be about you. And even when you do it, don't make it be my team did this. Again, it looks like, why is it my? Well, we did this together. And um, as, I've, as I've grown, I found that to be an even more refreshing way of allowing. Uh, and when success happens, often, you know, you don't have to often... Talk about it yourself. There'll be others who talk about it for you. And that's okay. And if no one talks about it, that's okay too. Um, so I think the blowing of one's own trumpet over time, you know, I mean, it's initially it's important to have people visible because you want to make sure you're not, um, you know, you aren't, you know, being uh, invisible. Then the other part of the question was, you know, staying humble and not being trampled over. Okay, that's important. I don't believe that, you know, any of the examples of humility in the Bible were people who were passive and were doormats. 
that allowed people to walk over them or they weren't tough negotiators. I mean, some of you who are on this Zoom work have worked with me. Uh, if you worked with me, you know how competitive I am to win a deal. Absolutely competitive. I hate to lose the competition. I've, I've trained my people on how to win against competitors. I'm brutally competitive in the marketplace. You might think, wait, this is the same person who I heard a Christian message about being a servant leader and humble, but he wants to win. Yes. Do you think Eric Little wanted to come second in the uh, race when he ran? No, he wanted to come first. He wanted to beat everybody else. So that doesn't mean that, you know, when you're negotiating, but you negotiate with grace. I've been often in very tough negotiations with the other side. We don't have to lose our temper and we don't have to, you know, lose our cool. We can say with fact and with calmness, this is my position. Or let's just say somebody in your team is not performing well and you have to make a change, sometimes even firing them. I've used words like this and say, listen, this is not acceptable. This is not the way we run a company. And we will not tolerate sloppiness in this company. We have to be a lot more crisp in how we handle this customer situation. I can speak even sternly, but I don't use, I mean, God forbid, I don't have to ever use cuss words and all that. I mean, it's sad when Christians have to cuss to get their point across. But you can be firm. You can be a, 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 not a doormat. So I feel like if you knew me at work, I mean, some of you have in this where I see some names of people who worked with me. You should feel no difference if you came tomorrow morning. Oh, sorry, Monday morning. Today is Saturday. Monday. And you were on a Zoom call with me at, at Cohesity. Or if you were at VM or SAP, you're like, wait, is this the same Sanjay Poon I heard on the Zoom call on Saturday? It should be no difference. Wait, this is a different person who's super competitive who wants to win. No, not at all. It's the same person. So I think there's a way to make sure that you're doing this with grace um, and with firmness. And I think, you know, th there were examples of that. Clearly, I think Jesus, when um, he was feeling like some of the outcasts were being pushed around, he stood up. Jesus was a friend of the underdog. So certainly when I've seen, you know, that happening in the workplace, or I feel we need to stand up for what's right or for a firm position in a particular negotiation or so on and so forth, we can do it with firmness when Christmas. We don't have to be... You know, it says we've got to be sharp as serpents and humble as doves. And the sharpness of serpents often have to be that we've got to be very crisp about what we say uh, in negotiations often. Often this is about your job. Maybe it's a pay raise that you need or a position you're taking um, in, in, in an engineering discussion or with a customer. And all of these, God will give you wisdom. And where you want to bounce some ideas off, find another person where you can bounce that idea off so that you can practice the argument, if you would, it's a little bit like a lawyer. They have a practice session before they go to court. And often I find I practice what I should think about um, as the argument. Um, and then when it comes time to play that out with a customer or in the boardroom, uh, God gives me wisdom to do that with grace. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, question number five is very uh, similar. It's in a management position, uh, how do I enforce discipline and speak firmly to ones that work for me? I think you answered this partially as well. But uh, And how do I find the balance between managing and being merciful? So anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I think it's tough, especially when you have to make cuts in the workplace. And, you know, the last few years, especially the last two years, have been tough during the Great Depression, Financial Depression in 2009. I've been through three um, recessions, one in 2000, 2001. I was relatively earlier in my post you know, post coming out of business school career. 2008, 2009 was another recession. And then, you know, the last two years has been tough. Um, and it teaches you tremendous amount of empathy. I tell people you need to treat people with a red carpet when they come in. And sometimes you have to treat them just the same way when they leave. There should be no difference where, when you have to treat people. And it's very tough. Think about someone who you have to let go. And they have a family. Um, it can be done with grace. Um, I often try to find, if I could, roles for other people in the industry, if I know people, even where I have had to make a tough decision. And unless I cannot be a reference, sometimes I can't be a reference for somebody because they've done something wrong. We have to sometimes take decisions in the workplace where they've done something unethical. I can't be a reference for that person. But if it was just a fit, like maybe some people are able to scale to a certain size of a company 
And then beyond that, it's beyond their skill set. And sometimes you may have to demote them or sometimes they have to leave. It doesn't mean that they're not a fit for a different type of job. I could still potentially be a reference for them. And I tell them, listen, if somebody calls me, I will authentically be a reference for you. I'm not going to put you down when somebody calls me as a reference just because we had to let you go of this company. And often they've found another good job and they're doing great in that new job. Praise God for that. We had to let them go from our company. They found another job. I'm cheering for their success. That's great. right? So when we deal, we're all going to be tested when we deal with people. And again, you know, the golden rule, do unto others as you'd want done to you. How would you want to be handled in an exit interview with somebody? Make sure if you are the manager having to exit an employee, you're treated the same way. That person has potentially a family, has a spouse, has children, has a parent. They're all going to go home and not be pleased. But, you know, um, treat them with dignity on their way out. Then when it comes to, to uh, I discussed this a little bit more, but let me say a few other things. When it comes to failure, when, I mean, you, maybe you, everybody has done a good job, but somebody in the team has let the team down. Okay, and That happens. I always think that, I mean, like I described it as look failure in a mirror and look at success through a window. I, I use that phrase. I mean, that can be a cavalier way of saying, well, you have to still correct the employee, don't you? Absolutely. But you correct that person in private. I don't believe it's a right thing to, to castigate an employee in a very public setting. These sort of public executions that happen in many companies, uh, I don't think is appropriate for Christian. You can find a way to have a private conversation with that employee saying, listen, this is unacceptable. We have to improve. And I am going to help you. I'm going to get in the trenches here and make sure it doesn't happen again. But often if that repeats itself, a couple of times you have to take some action and maybe remove that employee. So I think there's ways by which you can get performance. Sometimes it's not one individual, it's a team. Um, you know. And I often think the higher that person up is, the more their responsibilities are. Example, I'll give you an example. One of my engineering leaders um, was shipping a product and was supposed to ship the product on a particular date. Um, and it was one of our most anticipated products that we wanted to see shipped on a particular date. And the day before the release, the day before the release, he comes to me and says, it's going to be four weeks late. Four weeks late. Okay, what am I supposed to do now? Okay, I said, first off, listen, let me tell you a principle of how we run this company. These are my words. I'm going to tell you exactly how. How we run this company is if we're going to be late on a particular release, we need to know X, if it's going to be late by X days, we need to know two X before that. Okay. In other words, if you're going to be late by one day, we need to know two days before that. If you're going to be late by one week, we need to know two weeks before that. If you're going to be low, late by four weeks before you're saying, we should have known eight weeks before. It doesn't happen suddenly. Okay. Now that that's done, that's a, that's a teachable moment for the future. Let's get this done in a week or two, not four weeks. He got it done. He got it done in two weeks. But he learned the lesson. Now, what I also told his manager, he was two levels down from me, that's likely going to affect his bonus. Okay, Why should a sales rep who misses his quarter, misses commission, but an engineering leader who missed his deadline be able to make, not he makes a salary. He should get his bonus for missing his Notice how I dealt with that situation with firmness, but I was able to do a little bit of it in public, a little bit of it in private. And privately, now I go to this person and say, listen, you know what? You're one of my best engineering leaders. Never let that happen again. We go, we move forward. So that's how I would encourage you as you deal with tough, if you're a manager, God will give you wisdom of these kinds. These are things that I've learned over years and years. You want to make sure that that person's a good person. You're motivating them for the future. But you're not taking sloppiness easily at all. You're trying to create a high-performance organization that's constantly looking to be the best it can be. It's like a military, right? You're trying to be the best it can be, but you're doing it by encouragement and encouragement and exhortation. Okay, that was a failure, but we're in this together. Don't let that happen again. If it's happening two, three, four times, maybe we need to find a new person. But mistake here and there, that's okay. Let's move forward. Thank you, Sanjay. All right, we'll move forward to a set of questions which are on relationships in the workplace. The first one is around how I can share the gospel in my workplace. And a uh, corollary to that is how do I deal with those that might mock me for my faith, which has become more commonplace 
uh, as yeah. we stand up as Christians in the workplace? Uh, I mean, you know, when I grew up in India, I used to see many of these brothers who had a button on their shirt that says Jesus saves. Many of you have seen pictures of my dad's scooter. And I admired them because I didn't have the boldness as a teenager. Um, and then I see there's some brothers here in the church here who have scriptures on there. But wow, those, those inspirations, the people who put a Bible verse on their car or their scooter or on their shirt inspired me. Now, you know, in the workplace, it might be tough. And some people who are not Christian or are a different faith might find that offensive. So, and certainly as a, the, the leader at the top of my company, I don't feel that's appropriate for me to do it. But I'm not ashamed of my faith in, 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 in different other ways. So if you follow me on social media, on LinkedIn or Twitter, I'm public about the fact that I'm a Christian. I call myself an immigrant and a Christian. Yes, I'm entitled, it, but... And almost every Sunday, I post on Twitter a verse that's often... It's a verse I heard on NCCF. And... All of these messages, including many that I've spoken for 10, 20 years, are on YouTube. And I will tell you, almost every week, okay, I probably have 60 or 70,000 followers on LinkedIn. I'll get a message from someone who says, um, I am so blessed by the fact that you are public about your testimony because I've been struggling with how to be a Christian in the workplace. And when I see someone who, like you who is visible but is not ashamed to post um, uh, a verse. Now, I don't post a verse that all of you are going to hell, kind of. I mean, there, there are verses in the Bible that talks about all of you are going to hell if you don't do this. That's appropriate, maybe. But if there's a verse that can talk about, you know, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed those who humble themselves will receive grace, all of us can apply that. So God gives me wisdom on what to post. Um, and at times, even in the workplace, I will talk about being a servant leader. So again, this sort of picture of light and, and salt, God will give you wisdom. And if you have no boldness at all, um, and you just want to let your Christian life be seen through your actions and your words, praise God, brother or sister. Don't feel any pressure to say, I need to be the person who's got verses on my car uh, or I wear Christian t-shirts. That's okay. That might be for somebody else who has the boldness. And don't judge somebody who isn't that way. But in your words and actions, be a person of conviction. Don't compromise. So if you're getting led into a conversation, you can gently walk away. You don't have to go and say to those people, if you don't have the boldness to say, you know, all of you are sinners and you're all going to hell. That might be not appropriate for that time. And you may want to keep those people as colleagues of yours in the workplace as opposed to um, lose them as colleagues, professionals you're working with. But you can walk away gently. And not be in the midst of people who are making jokes or doing things that are inappropriate. And, you know, I will, I'll tell you a short story. I was uh, in, in some of my uh, classmates from high school, okay, Clarence School. Um, I finished there in 1985. We're doing a Zoom reunion. Okay? And uh, it was nice because some of them I hadn't seen it. It was a few years ago. And I joined the Zoom reunion. And the, one of these people said, said, oh, here comes Sanjay. We need to pause the meeting and pray. Okay. And obviously, he knew that because he knew it was Zach Poonin's son. And I thought, well, here it is, 30, 40 years later. All these people could remember word that I was a Christian. Praise God. Great. If that was my reputation to my classmates that I was Zach Poonin's son, and they think, okay. And they were joking about it. It was a sort of a joke. Great. That's my testimony here. And that's my way of being a testament. Test test I'm not ashamed of the Lord. I laughed at it and we continued. But in whatever way, you know, um, if you're made fun on, made fun of, treat that as your moment in front of the lions, uh, like Daniel, or you're being thrown in the fire. None of us have been uh, put to death. The Anything we face in the workplace is going to feel like a mosquito bite. I think some of the things that I may have faced at certain places, maybe a promotion that I didn't get, may have been because people didn't like my conviction. But I've said, look, if people don't like my conviction, um, then it's who I am. I'm going to stand for the Lord. I'm public in, in reasonable ways. Um, I have to do it in a way that is respectful. I always feel one other thing, let me sort of say related to this, right? 
there are people who find that Christians uh, are very discriminatory against beliefs that are not theirs or positions on issues, whatever it is. Okay, And we know a number of issues that divide today. I don't know, LGBTQ, pro-life choice, whatever have you, all of these issues. I think that I have chosen not to get into the middle of those debates in public, in the workplace, because I don't feel it's appropriate for me to sit up in a public spot uh, at the company and make that a point of vision. But instead, uh, I want to be known as the person who is the most fair, non-discriminating person to whatever people's belief is or, or so and so. So nobody can feel. I don't want a Christian to feel at Cohesity, well, I've got a special in with, Chris, with Sanjay because I'm a Christian. And for a Hindu or a Muslim, or someone who doesn't have the same kind of you know belief system on me, well, this person is going to discriminate. I think Jesus is one of the most fair people. And unfortunately to today, a lot of Christians come across as discriminatory. Okay? And none of that should be in the workplace, especially as you go higher. Um, we have to make sure that the workplace is the most discriminatory. It's easy to talk about gender and color discrimination because we're people of color and we want to make sure men and women are treated equal. But even if there's positions that you may not agree with, you know, spiritually, we can still be fair as a manager to those people. We should never allow um, unfairness to allow somebody, God forbid, if somebody gets a pay raise because they're Christian. Not at all. The most competent person should be the person who's rewarded, irrespective of who they would. And that's the type of workplace we want to create. Now, of course, private. I'm getting together with the Christians at Kohisti and I'm encouraging them and I'm praying with them. I'll tell you a short story. Within the first week of my joining the company, second week, I think it was, I got a call from this gentleman, wonderful gentleman named Robert Thomas. Um, uh, actually, I had called him about something. He was in, in a sales organization. And um, I asked him his advice on the phone on some deal that he was working on. At the end of the conversation, it was a 15, 20 minute, he asked me, Sanjay, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. Can I pray for you? And I about fell off my chair. I was two weeks in the job, and here was this person. I was calling him. Can I pray for you? I said, absolutely. I didn't know you were brother in Christ. He says, no, I'm not more than brother in Christ. I was a former pastor who decided to stop being a pastor. And I now want to get back in the workforce and become a sales rep. So he prayed for me. We, I prayed back. I said, Robert, I've got an idea for you. I'm second week in the job. Why don't you start a Bible study at Kohisri? Okay. And actually, even just start as a prayer group. And I know as a preacher, you're going to be somebody who may want to preach. Don't make, just read the Bible, a, a, a couple of chapters. I actually think it'd be better for you to lead it than for me. I'm the CEO of this company. I don't want to lead. I want you to lead it. I will come to it. Do it on a Friday morning. Do it over Zoom. Get as many people. You know what? Words start to spread little by little. They had a Slack channel where people said, hey, did you know there's a Christians that they call it the, the group on Slack was called the fellowship. It was obviously, you know, a private group, so not anybody could join it. Um, and every Friday for two years now, 8.30 to 9, there's a Zoom call where Robert or somebody else leads. They read the passage of scripture and a bunch of people pray. I don't know. There's probably out of about 2,000 employees in the company, maybe 50 people on that Slack channel. And praise God, this guy has become a witness in his own small way. So I will tell you that God could use you. Yeah, when I come to that group, it's like coming to NCCF. I, I tell them every time I join the Zoom call, I don't want you to treat me as CEO today. I am a brother of yours. I don't want to speak. I want to listen. Maybe I'll pray at the end. And there will be opportunities like that, brothers and sisters, where God uses you in a very special way. Now, I will tell you, many of those people who get together on that um, Friday, I don't, we may not doctrinally agree on everything. So they don't even, even need to go to NCCF, but we can agree on one thing. We can read the Bible, can't we? We can agree that we can pray to the Lord and say amen. So those are things that we, we you know, we, we have to, you know, not major on the minors, okay? There may be things where we doctrinally don't agree with people. We can still pray with them. We can still fellowship with them. We can still encourage them. Thank you, Sanjay. Great answer. Thank you for taking the time to answer that one specifically. Um, let's go to a couple more. We'll combine question seven and eight. Um, can you provide some advice on how to deal with 
conversations with colleagues in the workplace, especially the way there might be gossip about management, criticism colleague, uh, about colleagues, as well as perverse talk. And let's move to question eight as well, which says, related, is it okay for me to maintain friendships with non-Christians in the workplace, including social gatherings, without losing my Christian testimony? Yeah, I think the second one, you know, it's hard to be in places where you say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ever, you know, socialize. I think you have to just find boundaries where if you're finding, you know, that it's taking you away from things and, 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 and is dragging you certainly into activities that would be compromising a Christian, stay away from, run, run from sin. It, it's, it's, but if it's a dinner gathering uh, or if it's a lunch gathering, I find it harder to do some of those things when I have a family, when it's after work hours. But during the work, you know, if there's a lunch gathering or if I'm traveling um, in a workplace and there's a gathering often to get the team together, those are good ways to create camaraderie. Uh, the, often, you know, in the workplace, the more camaraderie you have with people, the more that you create um, an environment where they're excited about the mission. And certainly as a manager, you have to create camaraderie. In some senses, you're a little bit of a parent for those people who work for you. And that happens often, not just um, in one-on-one -on -one meetings, it happens in the type of dynamic. But you can create some of the camaraderie if you're a manager, maybe one day you bring coffee and donuts or bagels yourself on your own expense. There's ways by which you can create that even in a team meeting. Hey, today's Friday, I've decided for our team meeting, I've decided to bring some bagels in. Before we start with our main agenda, why don't we talk about something fun that happened this past week, or you find ways by which you create camaraderie inside your team. Camaraderie is very important because often a team that has that little chitter chatter or social, um, you know, kind of dialogue, um, you create the dynamic of wanting to work together more as a somewhat mini family. I don't like to use the word family in the context of work because work's never permanent. Families are permanent. But if there are ways by which you can create that camaraderie, um, that's helpful. And any place where you feel like this is where the Holy Spirit and your conscience, right? The conscience, uh, conscience, it says in the Bible, is like a rudder. A rudder is an incredible part of a ship. You see these big, big cruise liners with, with rudders that are not very big. But this incredible cruise liner can be guided into the small little spot where it can park with that rudder. Our conscience can be like that. It can guide you. Well, you know what? If it, you keep it sharp, well, maybe this is an appropriate conversation for you to exit now. Okay. Or if you're a manager, eh, you know, let's change the subject. Let's move on. And certainly the higher you are, you will cast a more of a shadow. Okay, The higher you are, you will cast a shadow. And your ability to change the subject is like, yeah, let's change the subject. People listen to you. Okay, the boss has said change the subject. Let's change the subject. So remember, the higher you're up you are, the more you're able to turn that ship. Okay, And you can turn that ship towards an iceberg, or you can turn that ship towards beautiful waters, right? So remember, if you have more responsibility, you can be the person that guides that conversation. You don't have to allow your team to take the conversation in a direction that's destructive. You can be that. And if you're then, if you're not, if you're just a lowly member, you're literally, you're not a, the, 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 a senior person in the team and you don't feel you, it's appropriate for you to turn the conversation, you can go to the bathroom. Come back, maybe the conversation's changed. There's multiple ways in which God gives you wisdom in how to deal with a situation and a conversation that's not going in a direction. Now, certainly if it's an activity that's sinful, run away from it. Absolutely do not have any part of it. And I would say one other thing, if it's illegal activity that's happening, I mean, this is, you know, even I think people who are not Christians would tell you this, you need to report that activity because it's very important that you're not associated at condoning illegal activity. They have a, they have a many companies now have what's called a whistleblower clause. Okay, you should be completely protected if there's illegal activity that you report to in a company. Don't ever feel that you will be indicted or in some way uh, reprimanded or you'll be people will take revenge on you if you see illegal activity that you should report. You should always be, that's actually illegal to condone illegal activity. You should never fear being able to take that to your head of HR, your head of legal and report illegal activity, including often harassment. Some of the women in the workplace, they get harassed, okay? There was a question, I don't know if it's been covered. If I'm constantly, if I'm a woman are being harassed, um, you know, how should I respond? Should I slap the person back? You know, if you have to defend yourself, if someone's physically the thing, I tell my daughter, defend yourself, okay? 
often women take mace in their in their uh, purse to make sure that they aren't being attacked. That's okay. But if you are being physically or verbally abused as a woman, you should not take it. You should report that incident to HR and to legal and make sure that harassment is never tolerated. Often in many companies, that type of harassment, people get fired. Okay, Sunil, sorry, right. keep going. <clears throat> yeah, no, that, that, that was good, very relevant. So question number nine, which was briefly brought up, uh, how do you interact with yourself, women in the workplace, or for people in general, interacting with the opposite gender in the workplace? The safest in mean, this is within groups. I mean, you know, some of my teams have more women, you know, some of my teams have less women. When you're one-on-one, -on -one, make sure it's in a public place so where people can see you. You know, sometimes I have to do one-on-ones with people who are, who are women who work for me. Do it in a place where it's not in a closed room. Um, you know, I just think even one-on-ones, um, better to do it in a place, in, in a workplace. And be very careful, especially with people who work for you, because you have power over them. Okay. Um, and it's appropriate. They could, they could feel, you know, pressure. And you have to be very, very careful uh, about your testimony. But in group settings, you know, where there's multiple men, multiple women, that's appropriate. Um, be very careful about how you look at people at a certain, you know, obviously we know Matthew 5, for men, it's a tremendous temptation to lust. Be very careful about that um, in the workplace. And when you have purity in your eyes, you can have a good relationship with women or vice versa, women with men in the workplace. Um, don't allow flirtatious discussion to become part of the banter. Keep it extremely professional. Encourage, I would say, encourage the people who are feeling down. I always feel like my job as a leader is to encourage that somebody in that room who is feeling a little bit like the underdog, okay, a man or woman. And when you find ways to do that, um, you know, I think you get away from this sort of gender type issues. And you have to be specifically, um, you know, especially careful if you're married, okay? Uh, because, you know, and not to say that well, single folks shouldn't be, um, you also do. But, uh, you know, the temptations could be extremely high. I've seen many, many Christian men who have fallen because they're not faithful. Um, in small ways, before you know it, they've had an affair. It's just it's a it's a slippery slope, and um, I think especially men um, be very careful about dialogues that go beyond what you need to have with certain people. And when you handle a conversation, do it professionally, and beyond that, God will give you wisdom. Thanks, Andre. Um, number ten says. Uh, I am struggling to find fellowship in the workplace and it's sometimes lonely. Can you provide some advice on how to deal with this? I, my testimony is there is usually almost in every workplace, one person who wants to read the Bible. I've not been, I mean, Christians were 1% in India. Okay. Now they happen to be a little higher percentage in Bangalore and in certain parts of India, like Kerala, it's a little higher. And I happen to go to Christian school. But from at least the last three companies I worked at, VMware, Cohesity, SAP, there's more than one Christian who wants to read the Bible. Somehow you have to find them, though. It might feel a little bit like a needle in the haystack, but I tell you, there's been often more. And the challenge, though, is they may not agree with everything you do. They may not go to the church you agree. That's okay. Hey, brother, can we get together and just read something from Psalms and Proverbs once? a week, and maybe pray. And I will tell you, you will find them. And if there is a group that's happening in, in your workplace, see if you can join it. And just join that as often as you can just to read the Bible with them. Okay? And you may find, okay, they may not be all exactly the same way. They may be compromising some. But man, the Word of God is so powerful. It's like a two-edged sword. If you just spend a half an hour reading the Bible and, and praying, you know, that could happen. So, Pray that the Lord will open, like I gave you that story of Robert Thomas, this person. Um, and if you're the higher up you are, okay, the more you need to go into that group and be the lowliest person. Don't try to go in that group and be the boss. If you are higher up, be the humblest brother. And if you're a humble brother, maybe you should be the leader of that group. 
Okay, this is the, the beauty of the last will be first, the first will be last. Um, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. And sometimes you may be the person who feels initi uh, initiative to lead that effort. You don't need to make it some CFC type of church. All you do is a half an hour call where maybe you read the Bible or you play um, a devotional or you play a song and then you read and pray. That's it. And I'm, I, it's my testimony, certainly the last 20 years, that there's more than one Christian. And I have found, I'm telling you, at every one of this workplace, at least one Christian that uh, I can relate to. So pray that the Lord will open up that person to you. Again, the smaller the company, maybe the less likely that is, but for many larger companies. But don't feel like you need to agree with them on everything doctrinally. That may not happen. Okay, You can all agree to read the Word of God. Thanks, Andre. Um, so now we'll just transition to maybe a rapid fire round, maybe 30 seconds to a minute for some quick tactical questions. We'll just bring up maybe the next uh, three or four. So number 11 is how do you deal with uh, non-Christian religious festivals, greetings, gifts in the workplace that are done in seemingly secular ways? I think it's a little bit like you have to have, either you have the conviction like Daniel, I'm not going to accept, you know, this food. Um, you know, but when Paul says, do you eat food that's offered to idols or not? I don't judge someone who ha eats food. I don't know if it was offered to an idol or not. Uh, so I would not be, I, I don't have the personal conviction to say if someone eats or someone doesn't eat, they're wrong. Um, certainly to me, if it's a sinful activity, I don't want to be involved with it. Um, I don't reciprocate often if someone offers me a happy XYZ, you know, festival that's, you know, a religious festival. I don't reciprocate back in because I don't celebrate that festival. I say, God bless you or, you know, have a good day or something else. You know, God bless, God can get bless everybody. He makes the sun to shine on the wicked and the evil. So I genuinely bless God's blessing on everybody. So God bless you is not a bad way, um, you know, to respond to somebody who, who, comes to me with a particular favorite uh, religious festival. Um, you know, I will tell you one thing that, you know, this religious, not related to religious festival. Often people will share with you in the workplace something they're going through that is painful. Okay? If you become their friend, um, they'll share with you. And many of them are not Christian. You know, the most poor, powerful words I have often said to them, I will pray for you. Actually, five words. Or, or, or can I pray for you? Five, five words. When someone says, can I pray for you? What are you going to say to them? No. Okay. I mean, so it's amazing. A couple of atheists in the workplace, in, I think it was 10 years ago. Um, child was going through an enormous amount of some health issue. Shared with me the incident. He worked on my team. And I said, you know, I won't mention his name. I said, I'll pray. can I pray for you? He says, absolutely. Thank you. He doesn't have, a, doesn't have any faith in God, an atheist. Five years later, he left the company. I get a text message from him on my phone on a Sunday morning. He says, Sanjay, I never forget that time when you said, pray for you. Somehow, your God has been bringing me closer to you. I've been starting to go to church. And now I can tell you, I'm praying too. And so it didn't even happen because of what I said. Come on, somebody else had come to him. And he, that Sunday, was also having an issue with the Sunday. He said, listen, I want you to ask again, can you pray for my daughter? Um, I'll get other messages from people who's like, hey, I'm not a Christian, but I know you're the big man upstairs. They joke about it. The big man upstairs listens to you more than he listens to me. Can you pray for me? So I will tell you that God will give you ways by which you can share your faith. You know, I, I mean, I'm using this in the wrong context, just the religious mode is, can I pray for you? Uh, or I will pray for you could be very powerful words you share with them. Sorry, uh, Sunil, this was more than a 30-second answer. No problem. Uh, I think it was very relevant, uh, tangential, uh, and uh, what an amazing testimony. Uh, I think it's worthwhile, and I, 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 won't, I personally won't forget that testimony. Um, number 12, rapid-fire question. Uh, I have a job that require me, requires me to work on a Sunday. How would you advise I deal with that? Again, again, I come back to Eric Little, right? Um, didn't run the race uh, for the Olympics, but then later on was organizing a race. So I don't judge someone who doesn't. Doesn't if it's a repeated pattern, you're missing church. But if it's occasional, you have to do it. It's understandable. I don't judge. At the same time, if you have the conviction, I respect you. But you have to ask yourself, where is your treasure? 
Okay. Where your treasure is, there's where your heart will be. That's my 30 second answer. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. All right. To rapid fire question number three, which is a fun one and very relevant. Is it okay to use chat GPT to help with my work and present it as my own? Or is that being deceitful? Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. This may be a little longer than 30 seconds. When chat GPT first came out, I asked chat GPT, can you write me a Zach Poonen sermon? Okay. Because I wanted to send a Zach Poonen sermon to the Zach Poonen. And um, it came back with a sermon. I said to my dad, my dad laughed. This is not me at all. So I refined it. I said, can you give me a Zach Poonen sermon on holiness? And then I sent back that sermon and my dad was like, this is more like me. Where did this come from? Okay. So my point is, it's a beautiful, it's a wonderful tool. Okay. It is actually, it's helpful. Um, it's going to be the basis of how it's a very powerful summarization tool. Um, and there's going to be a lot of ethical dilemmas people present to it. But it's it's just like spell check or grammar check. It's an one of the most incredible innovations of generative AI. I encourage you to use it. Obviously, if your workplace has um, restrictions and rules on it that you can't use an external GPT tool because the data goes outside your firewall, you have to obey those. But I think colleges and schools and workplaces are all going to have guidelines. But to me, it's like spell check and grammar check. If you're allowed to use it, you should. And you know, yeah, don't ever claim other people's work as your own, but people accept the fact that everyone's going to be doing that. I mean, do you think that everybody who writes a, a paper has perfect spelling because their spelling is perfect? No, they use the spell check inside Word. So do they have to say, well, I use the spell check within Word? At some point in time, everyone's going to be using ChatGPT. It will become part of the parcel of life. Great answer. Um, we'll combine 14 and 15 as rapid fire questions. Uh, and this has got to do with honesty in the workplace. I interact with government agencies. They expect me to give bribes to get the job done. And number 15, which is related, is my management is expecting me, uh, question number 15, is expect, my management is expecting me to be dishonest in reporting on something. How can I deal with this situation? Yeah, clearly if there's dishonesty, you need to report it. I mean, these are illegal things that get you in trouble and you need to have what's called a whistleblower uh, protection. In HR and legal, you can report behavior where someone's asking you to do something illegal, dishonest. Now, they would say, well, it's black and white. It's not really clear. But if it's black and white and dishonest, you shouldn't do it. And you should also report of your managers asking you to do it. Not because you're trying to rat on your manager, but though that's the kind of behavior that if you are caught, and it'll implicate you too. Um, you know, listen, I, none of us should be accused of, of giving bribes and doing bribes. I always worry that sometimes when I'm doing business in certain countries, I'm paying an agent to do something. And behind the scenes, that agent's really doing a bribe. I don't know for sure. But they tell me, well, how do you think that agent's really getting things done? You're paying an agent to get this thing done in, I don't know, whichever country, right? Uh, because we can't get it done ourselves. And that agent, and I feel like at some point in time, if I have to probe how every person is doing things well, if they have a clean record by the government they're doing business with to get things done, um, I'm going to do business with them. I'm not responsible for probing the, the behaviors of every agent we use in every country. Uh, however, they're legally doing things that agent will be describing. We have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that governs all of us in the U.S. as to how we can do business. It's the same principles I would apply to how you deal with it. If you're directly doing something that would be in violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, you shouldn't do it. Period. End of story. Including a bribe. But if you're paying somebody else and you don't know for sure whether they're doing it or not, it's an ambiguous place because it's not our job to investigate every agency as to whether they do it. There's, there are groups of people who investigate whether that happens and the FCPA will basically disqualify them. So this is where one of those gray areas where, you know, there are many countries where a tip is a tip of bribe. Um, I don't get into the middle of many of those discussions, especially if it's being done through a third party that's a legal agency that can get things done. So for those of you who don't understand all that I've talked about, probably not relevant to you, but in many um, developing countries, you have to do things through an agency. And often those agencies are providing tips and so on and so forth to uh, you know, companies get things done. I find some of that is sometimes a gray area. I think that's a great uh, dif differentiation between a tip and a bribe, a tip being one that might accelerate work being done versus a bribe where you're getting something illegal yeah. done. And, yeah. uh, and usually so they, most, most countries have laws 
that differentiate that. And I usually say, you know, if it's a country that's trying to buy by the laws, FCPA is an example of a law um, that will make it very clear where one's a bribe and a tip that crosses a certain line. All right. Thank you, Sanjay. So in the interest of time, uh, Brother Matthew, if you don't mind, we'll just go to the last question and we'll wrap up with this with question number 18. Um, this is, uh, Sanjay, this will be the last one and take your time to answer this. Uh, uh, many people in this economy are struggling to find a job and are have been unemployed for a while. Uh, they've been earnestly seeking the Lord in prayer, tempted to discouragement. Um, can you speak to whether they are lacking in faith and what advice you might have for them in, in terms of dealing with this very, very difficult season and situation. Let me say first off, um, this is a really, my heart goes out um, to the person who's written this, but let me first say to the people who are listening to this question, okay, who have a job and you know somebody in this category, you need to be as burdened for this person as somebody in your family who is sick with an illness. You need to have a burden. Imagine if one of your children was sick, okay? You would pray for that, that child every day, every day. And especially in the body of Christ, when one member of the body suffers, we all suffer. And when we pray, Lord, when we pray for bread, you'll not give us a stone. We need to pray for brothers in our midst who are, or sisters in our midst who are struggling and cannot earn a living, probably tapping to their savings. Some of them have to go through some dark because of a job. And it needs to be a burden just as, as, as a burden that we have in our own family for someone who's sick. And I say that to all of us who are, are surrounding, you don't have to make a public spectacle of it and pray for that person publicly, but it should be a burden on our heart to pray for that person uh, on a regular basis with a burden, Lord, I'm going to pray for, and mention that person's name in your head. Lord, I pray that you will miraculously open doors for that person. Okay, so those, that's for those of us who are praying around somebody who doesn't. For those of you who are going through that, never feel discouraged. Uh, as I said, discouragement is, should never be, should be a no entry street. That's easier said than done, though. And how do we encourage ourselves? Um, <clears throat> Hopefully, there are brothers and sisters, your family, who can pray with you. And I find that when I'm going through discouragement, I need somebody to pray with. And it's a little bit like walking that road of Emmaus. And I said, Lord, that, or, or a better picture is actually Pilgrim's Progress. To me, one of the beautiful story, pictures of Pilgrim's Progress is God did not allow Christian, Pilgrim then became Christian, to walk alone. First it was faithful, then it was helpful. Um, they walked with somebody else. Lord, give me somebody else I can walk with. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's another brother in Christ. And don't feel ashamed. Say, brother, can I pray with you? Because this is a burden in my heart. Pray with me that the Lord will open it. Pray with a brother and maybe even seek their advice on how you might think about the job application process. Maybe do some mock interviews with somebody in the church who can refine you. See, part of doing a job interview is you got to come across a certain way during the interview process. And a lot of that's just practice. And good news is in the church, if he's given you another brother that you can practice this with, it's a friendly audience. And maybe you've done 10 interviews and all 10 of them you got rejected. And you find out from the 10 interviews what your, your, your missing quality is or whatever have you. Okay, for the 11th interview, you're going to practice. And it's a little bit like fishing, right? You're throwing fishing rods out there. But we as a body of Christ need to help the brothers and sisters around us uh, of course, if you have leads that can get them roles, that's for sure the way you can help. But we can help in, in both prayerful ways and also practical ways. Come alongside that brother, do some mock interviews with them, help them. Okay, how do you, how do you present yourself when you um, um, get asked these questions? Right? Here's the, que the, the advice I give people. What are the most common questions you've been getting in an in a interview? And how do you feel you're answering them? Write down the answers. Let's mock that interview. These are ways by which you can practically help somebody tune up their game and get them ready uh, for them. These are, this is, you don't have to go to a career counselor. We can do this for our brothers and sisters. And, and those of you who are skilled and are, are good in the workplace, we owe it to the other brothers and sisters in the church to help them. Even if we can't find them a job, we can help them get tuned up so that when the right door opens. But that's the way we can be an encouragement. And if you're feeling discouraged, 
brother or sister, because you're looking for a job, go and find another brother. It might be humbling to do it. That's okay. Find a brother or sister who can encourage you uh, and the door will open. I truly believe if we, if we hold fast to that promise, when you ask for bread, he will not give you a stone. But we pray. And these are tough times. The, the last two years have been extremely tough in the Silicon Valley for sure. Um, maybe also in some of the other countries represented in the call here. But clearly in Silicon Valley, after the pandemic, which was a little bit of a false mirage, a lot of jobs were created. There was a downturn in the last two years and a lot of people lost their jobs. So we can pray uh, for those of those who are still in that process uh, and then rejoice with them when they do find a job. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, incredibly grateful for you taking the time out of your busy, busy schedule to spend time with this group of hungry souls that have gathered to listen and especially with the last hour of very practical answers to questions that have been in my mind in my discernment spirit-filled and not just human psychology and i praise god for the wisdom that he's given you from above to answer those in a spiritual way with the guidance of his holy spirit and not just with uh what would seem like good psychology so we're incredibly thankful to the lord for your message as well as for the uh, answers to the questions you provided. Um, and for those who didn't have their questions answered, we will be publishing answers to those questions online through one of the CSU uh, sites as well. Sanjay, any closing thoughts before we close? Oh, thank you, Sunil, for, and Brother Matthew and all the team. I know this took a lot of diligence. This is you do this, uh, whatever frequency the last time was with Sunil. So for the, all of you who put this together, it's an incredible ministry. Thank you, Brother Matthew, for organizing this and brother Sunil for uh, my brother Sunil, um, both my physical and my spiritual brother uh, for facilitating this. I'm really honored. I'm just I was speaking, so I didn't get to see many of your faces here, but I'm just browsing through the screens and I know many are on uh, YouTube too. I just appreciate, I hope this was a blessing to you and um, one day we will all see each other in eternity. I don't get to see you all physically, but we will all rejoice in eternity. And I will tell you when we get to eternity, we, most of these questions won't matter anymore. Well, Thanks, Sanjay. Okay, we can uh, spend, uh, just spend a minute in prayer and then uh, open it up for uh, informal interactions. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather together to hear practical words of spiritual wisdom, Holy Spirit-inspired words. Thank you for giving Sanjay utterance um, during uh, th this morning, Lord, here in the U.S. and whatever time it is uh, around the world, Lord. I pray that the words that you have spoken would convict our hearts, Lord, to repent of something that we've perhaps not heard before and that we would be encouraged and um, provoke to live better lives, live lives that honor you in the workplace, to be men of integrity, Lord, that seek to glorify you, to seek to work before you and for your approval and not for men's, Lord. Thank you for the utterance. Thank you for, despite of course, more for the utterance that you gave Sanjay, Lord, and for the practical, wise answers that we can take back. I pray that you would bring some of these to our memory as we're reminded and bless many others who will be listening to this recording as well, Lord. Um, I pray that you might be glorified and bless uh, the rest of our uh, weekend individually, wherever we are. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, Brother Matthew, if you don't mind, if we can just bring up really quickly the display of contacts and websites and YouTube links for the benefit while people are... Sure, uh, sure. still on so that um, before they drop off and then we'll have a brief time mm -hmm. maybe 10-15 minutes to about 9.30 here Pacific time 10 p.m. in India where we can say hi to Sanjay maybe just introduce yourself and say where you're from uh, but let's just wait for a minute so one of the things that, that has that has often come up in meetings like this is people are very curious to find out how they can hear more how they, you know, Sanjay referenced the daily devotional that is a 15 minute 
segment that his children listen to on their way to school and that he tries to listen to? Where can I find out more information about that? Where can I hear similar messages to this? Where can I hear when Sanjay is speaking from a uh, from his local church? Where can I hear more about this? So these are some of those websites. Um, the U.S. ones, River of Life Christian Fellowship in Colorado, uh, NCCF, New Covenant Christian Fellowship, where Sanjay is an active uh, member uh, uh, helping build the body over there. Uh, and then our core parent church in, in India, in which was started by my dad, uh, Zach Kunin, CFC at cfcindia.com. And um, yeah, many, many other uh, useful information that you can take advantage. Feel free to screenshot it while it's still up. Um, the YouTube channels, very, very relevant. Um, it's CCF Church is our local church channel where you can hear messages from folks uh, like Sanjay when they speak and uh, other, uh, when the elders speak there as well. Uh, RLCF, uh, a sister church of ours in Colorado, and then uh, CFC India in Bangalore. And uh, my father, Zach Poonen, is often speaking at many of these churches, either on Zoom or in person. So that's a great way to find him and some of the latest messages over there. And then on the top right, you see the daily devotionals. Uh, this is probably the most important resource. If you don't take anything away from this, a great 10-minute segment, which an amazing team of video editors uh, from our home church in Bangalore has put together to just take out segments of sermons and turn it into a calendar of 10-minute devotionals on a specific topic where you're just listening to a segment of a message that was preached uh, uh, by my dad. And it's a great way to have something small, even if you don't have time to read the Bible because you're busy in the morning, because you're busy getting out of bed, getting ready to get in the car, to drive to work, put on this daily devotional. And it's a great way to set, uh, sanctify the Lord as first in your life uh, early in the morning as you uh, take in this daily devotional. So highly, highly recommend all of you take note of that and subscribe to that. Okay, with that, we can uh, bring down this page and we can open it up to for the next 10 minutes for all of you, whichever part of the world, feel free to jump in, uh, say hello, tell us where you're from, just be brief, five seconds, where you're from, who you are, feel free to greet Sanjay. Hello, Brother Sanjay. This is Ashwin Pujari from CFC, I'm in Mumbai, India. Great to see you, brother. Yeah, good to see you too. Wonderful example, brother. Praise God. To God be the glory. Hi, Brother Hello, Sanjay. Uh, uh, this is Samuel uh, from New York, United States. So it's good to hear from you. I've been listening to Razak messages from 2014, 2015 or thereabout. And it has been a blessing to me. Thank you very Praise much. God. Great, great. Welcome from New York. Yeah, good morning, Okoli Tochuku from Nigeria. Um, I've been with this um, ministry since uh, 2013. I've actually been following the opponent, listening to his messages, and it has been a lot of blessing to me. I see it as a way of life here in the company, and it has really helped me. And the wisdom God used it to share with us this, I've seen it also work in a work environment. So I want to really say thank you. Keep Praise God, you brother. Up. Really, really good to see you from Nigeria. Thank you for your for your testimony. Good evening, my brethren. I'm also Christiana Eliojo from Nengese from Nigeria. Happy Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. It's great to see many continents. We have India and the US and Africa. Great, great. Hello, this is Izu online. Um, I don't know, I sent in a message. Um, if I could get any uh, word of encouragement, that would really, really help me. I actually have a lot to say, but I know we have a very short time. So I sent in a message. If I could get anything, that would be nice. Is that okay, Peter? brother. Is that Peter? Well, well, yes, Peter. From yes. Peter. Yes. Yes. We'll have somebody, or I'll look at it, brother. I didn't see that question myself, but. God bless you. You're in Dublin, Ireland? Yes, I'm from Nigeria, but I live in Dublin. I Dublin, actually Ireland. have a lot to say. I've, I've, I talked with Brahma Matthew three years ago, and it's, the same thing is still going on. So if I could get any encouragement, any help, I'll okay. be there. We'll have somebody contact you. It's good to see you. We're going around the world. We have U.S. so far, India, 
Africa and now we have Europe also. Okay, good. It's good to see the continents filling out. Well, sure. Europe, you also have Belgium. Hello, I'm Debbie from Belgium. Wonderful. Thanks Welcome, for, Belgium. Thanks for your sharing. It's really powerful. Thank you very much. Praise God. Good to see you all from Belgium. Thank you. Also from Africa here, Nathaniel from Ghana. Um, it's been it's been very amazing. I've been following Brother Zach since 2012, and I've been blessed a lot by his ministry and all the, the ministry. Thank you very much for what you shared today, Sanjay. Brother, thank you. Good to see you from Ghana, too. Great. God, God bless you. And for those of you looking for encouragement or to reach out and get some contact in your area, there's actually a great resource for that. We'll flash that up right before we close. Uh, you can email cfc at cfcindia.com or one of the other email addresses on there. And we have a network of people who are receiving uh, Brother Zach's messages where uh, we've been able to connect two or three people in close areas. And sometimes that's been the beginning of a church in a very strange way where, in other ways, these people would not have been connected. So please do reach out to those email addresses. We will flash it up again before we close this call. And um, in the meantime, by all means, use the daily devotional as a way to be encouraged every day uh, in the absence of uh, uh, real-time fellowship that you might have with other brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Brother, brothers Vincent, uh, Jesudas, Thomas Koshi, all of you can <clears throat> share whatever you'd like to. Just, you know, thanksgiving, thanksgiving for this meeting. Dear Brother Sanjay, we are very thankful for your time and really all the real-time experiences has blessed us, encouraged us, and especially those who are working face lots of challenges and doubts. And we hope we'll have many more sessions like this to strengthen us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Brother Vincent. Good to see you. Uh, you're yeah. in Bellor today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came good. to Tengani yeah. Kota for the meeting. Yeah, I'm in Bellor. That's Bello great. Today. Yeah, good yeah. good to you. see you. And thank you for your faithfulness also uh, in many, many regards, translations and a variety of um, leadership. So good to see you all and God bless you. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. We thank you. We thank Brother Matthew also for the burden. God has the grace and the anointing to organize this. And yes. we especially thank Brother Sunil for wonderfully moderating it. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless. Hello, brothers. Uh, Sanjay. Uh, thank Sanjay. you very much. from the, uh, This is Thomas from Dubai CFC. On yes. behalf of the brothers and sisters, really thank you for the practical word and especially the Q&A, we really blessed by it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Sunil and Matthew also. Really appreciate all the efforts. God bless you all. Praise God, Brother Thomas. God bless you all in uh, the Middle East and Dubai. Well, Sanjay, I was very encouraged when Sunil said that uh, you consider others as more important. So what a wonderful testament. Praise God. It's only the mercy of the Lord. Like I said, I learned some of that from my mother. Uh, but I also, as the Lord, as I've gotten older, I think that's weighed on me even more. We all have to, um, and if we learn from the Apostle Paul, his own example, uh, we can all, you know, as we get older, realize there's many more in the Lord who are way more important than us. Thank you, Thank you Brother Sanjay. Sanjay. Uh, I'm Jesus from Chennai. Thank you for the word that you shared and for the excellent uh, Question and answer session. All your answers with the practical examples were very useful. I hope it has blessed everyone who attended it. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, you. Thank, Thank you, Brother Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Brother Jesus. And God bless all of you in Chennai. I used to call Chennai Madras when I was growing up, but yeah. now it's Chennai. So God bless you all there in that wonderful city. Thank you, Sunil. And uh, Thank brother you. Yeah. Hello, Scott. brother. This is Joel from Mysore, Mysore CFC. Hey, brother. Good to see you. Uh, how are you, brother? I recently moved to the UK for my higher studies. So I'm doing great here. Thank you for all the encouragement you have given me and uh, for all the messages that you have been sharing today. So, yes, I remember coming to, coming to Mysore. Are you calling from Mysore right now or from UK? No, no, brother. I'm in the UK. Now. Oh, great. great. God bless you. Be a witness in your new country. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you for everything, brother. Increase Praise God. Praise God. Uh, I'm from Hyderabad, and uh, thank you so much for the values that you've told, the basis that you have, the 10 points uh, that 
you emphasized before uh, do, uh, doing something big or aspiring something uh, i i am preparing for an exam and it's i've always had this doubt whether to whether i can have an aspiration or i should only follow god and today i think uh, it's cleared a lot of confusion around that so thank Praise you god. god bless you and your exam and thank i'm you. sure he'll give you wisdom to do well god bless thank you brother amen you. All, all of you in hyderabad thank you uncle hello brother we are from cfc bangalore that's great my my home church cfc bangalore yeah we are inside the church only currently oh you're inside the church that's even better that's great yeah that's great. thank you brother thank you for the encouragement i know it's late in india so late india night time so thank you for staying up thank you brother thank you brother thank you so much for the blessed uh, sermon today and uh, it was a blessing to hear from you especially in the challenging days of uh, an id industry so thank you lord brother every god bless you brother thank you god 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 be the glory thank you so oh, much for your interaction uncle uh, as someone i'm going to start working soon uh, i think it's you've given a lot of practical advice this is sonia and i'm from cfc bank lord thank you so much god bless you god bless you sister the lord needs many sisters in the workplace too so god bless you and be faithful <laughs> I'm going to piggyback on Sonia and represent the sisters in the workplace. My name is Miriam Kamal. I'm in New Jersey and uh, uh my husband's cousin leads the fellowship uh, the CFC fellowship in Pittsburgh and he's the one who shared your link so I was very encouraged. I would love for you um Sanjay to be able to share among our young adults at, in colleges. I have to sons at, uh, in college here in New Jersey and uh, they do have a heart for the Lord and they attend a Christian fellowship in a secular school and it would be wonderful to see uh you know uh people of from similar background uh from the Indian diaspora who are successful in the US but also holding on to our faith so if you find yourself in New Jersey I would love to connect you with my son who attends a christian fellowship and le- actually he's leading a study there and uh, just to hear from you you know and uh, encourage the next generation yeah so happy to i don't come to new york new jersey that often except very quick business trips but certainly over zoom like this um, i often do this with with uh, uh sure. college brothers uh, it might be possible send uh, the organizers put a email address for the matthew uh, we can we there's a central email address and um, i'm happy to do uh, a zoom video sometime when it's convenient absolutely thank you like our burden is for the next generation and we need yeah. to really uh, god bless you and your and your and your children in college thank you thank you so much sanjay for the word you have shared today i've been quietly following you for a while and again i've been following cfc india for about 10 years now that has been such a, an encouragement and thank you for the work today thank you sunen also for contributing thank you so much i'm grateful are you are you calling from nigeria brother yes i'm calling from nigeria i think there's more people from nigeria than india on the call no i'm joking <laughs> but uh, it's great to see all of these wonderful christians from nigeria and ghana So uh, praise God for the way in which God is using you in that country in your country. Uh, I have not been to Nigeria in person. I look forward to being there one day. Yes, we are looking forward to host you. Knowing fully where that maybe one day. It'd be great to have you in Nigeria. Nigeria. Maybe maybe, maybe one day if the Lord opens the door. It's okay. We we'll are glad to have you, sir. Praise God. Yeah, I'm also Thank from you. Nigeria actually, but I moved to the United States uh, in January this year. And uh, while I was in Nigeria, I've been following Brother Zach Puner. And so I sent an email to Sony if we can have a CFC in Buffalo here where I am schooling. I'm a PhD student at the University of Buffalo, so if I send them an email if we can have a CFC yeah. here so that we can fellowship. Yeah, yeah Sam, I I I saw your note and uh, I will connect you with the right resources who can help you connect if there's any fellowship in that area or in that vicinity. Thank you. Yeah, uh this is Kiran uh, brother. Thanks for your message. Uh, 
it's been really encouraging uh, i'm from san antonio i live in texas uh, and uh, i've been sacked from the job and uh, it's been really encouraging since then i was discouraged and uh, it gave me a strength thank you thanks for the work that uh, god is using yeah as a body right, of great. christ good to good to see you brother you know there's a fellowship um it's in yeah. austin it's near you and yes um, yeah i know pray the lord yes. pray the lord will open the right door for you pray with faith that when god you know when you ask for bread he won't give you a stone so he'll open the right door for you yeah thanks brother titus Hi, brother from India, Sunday. uh thank you so much brother uh for helping us and encouraging us on a real time basis what are the uh, difficulties uh, we are which we are facing in the workplace it's really encouraging and uh, we will you know live for the lord for the glory of the lord in the workplace thank you dear brother sanjay absolutely brother good to see you god bless you all thank you brother thank you thank sanjay you, thank you brother thank you for the example that you are to all of us in the workplace uh, we're very encouraged thank you praise god praise god let's continue to all be witnesses thank you Brother, oh, thank you, brother. 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 And the fellowship there. So God bless you all in Switzerland. Thank you, brother. We are actually driving, brother. So we are listening as a family in the yeah, car. No worries. Stay safe. Stay safe on the road. And God bless you all and uh, the fellowship in Switzerland. Thank you. Uh, hi, brother Sanjay. Hi. This is uh, Abraham. I'm uh, dialing in from Perth, Australia. Thank you so much for the words of encouragement that you gave. Uh, really. Uh, Thank you for all sharing the testimonies, various ways in which God connects to pe- connects you to people. That really encouraged me, because sometimes I work in a very lonely settings. And thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see Australia also represented. I was feeling like that part of the world was being a little lonely, so I'm glad you you chimed in here. God bless you, brother Abraham. And there are many good believers we know in different parts of Australia. Um, so I pray that you're able to be connected with them um, and stay encouraged. Uh, yes, brother. By the grace of God, uh, I, I'm connected to a fellowship in Perth. Uh, Been really encouraged. There. Praise God! Great to hear that. God bless you. Yes. Michael, Michael, you, Michael Haynes, no? Thank and you, thank you. Your message. Uh, almost all the questions I had was answered. Uh, thank you for the practical examples as well. Uh, God bless you. God bless you, sister. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah. London CFC. Yeah. Great. God bless you. Hello, Christina from Italy. Lovely to put a face with the voices in your name. And thank you wholeheartedly, Mr. Sanjay. It was really a deep uh, session. And of course, God bless you, everyone. And take care. God bless you, sister. Good to see uh, Christians being... Uh, here on this from Italy, so we're getting more countries now. It's great. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Sanjay, uh, uh, for the word of encouragement, especially uh, the Q and A session. I'm really blessed with the practical example uh, that you gave us. I'm really blessed. Thank you so much. Thank you, sister. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Sanjay. This is uh, Danny dialing in from Qatar. Thank you for the practical advice and encouragement. Great, great to see Qatar. God bless you, Danny. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much, Brother Sanjay, for the messages. Uh, really, I'm blessed. My name is Susan Chijambu from Uganda. I'm connected to CFC Abu Dhabi. I am being, I've been blessed. May the Lord bless you so much, Brother Sanjay, Brother Zach, and the all CFC family. God bless you for all the messages. We've been blessed. Amen. God bless you, Brother Kajamo. Good to see you being, and good to see someone from Uganda also. Um, and God bless you. 
Uh, you're in the Middle East now? You're living there? Yes, brother. Okay. God bless you. <laughs> Amen. Hi, Brother Sanjay. I'm Manisha from Kerala. I was struggling with few work-related questions and cannot thank God for this perfect timing. Thank you so much for the sessions, for the guidance and words of encouragement. And a big thanks to the organizers as well. God bless you, sister. God, I hope glad, glad it was helpful and hope God continues to guide you in your walk with him. Uh, thank you so much, Brother, for uh, the word of encouragement. Uh, so at the moment, uh, I, I'm from Canada, uh, India. So uh, at the moment, I'm just uh, seeking the Lord's uh, power, to, uh, power to just obey His words more and, uh, and to be more uh, strong in the Lord. So, uh, so sessions like these help, help a lot to just stay encouraged and uh, especially this message of as I also uh, was working in a, in a work environment. So uh, thank you so much, brother, for uh, uh, sharing with sharing the word of God. Thank you, brother. <laughs> God bless you. <clears throat> hey, brother, this is Satya from Vishakapatnam, India. Uh, brother, uh, thank you for sharing, brother, uh, for checking points as a, from family, how to be in balanced life uh, with work and this. Uh, this has encouraged me. Also, a lot of things has actually I learned, and it is a big challenge for me to coming days. Uh, thank you for uh, helping, and please pray for me, brother. Thank you, brother. Oh, God bless you, brother, and bye, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, brother Sanjay. From I'm from Hyderabad. I'm Madhu. Thank you for your valuable time. We are expecting more conferences with your siblings too. God bless you, brother. Thank you for the witness of all of you in Hyderabad. So, brothers and sisters, we'll have about five minutes now, and then we'll close. Hello, brother. Uh, this is Arul. Uh, I'm with uh, Brother Vincent. He's in our church. Yes. Uh, I'd like to uh, tell you what the Lord has, how, how the Lord blessed me through you in one, uh, very briefly. I studied software engineering, but someone convinced me that I cannot be a software engineer and uh, be a Christian. So I didn't join. But later sometime, uh, the Lord showed me that you are a top executive in VMware. That gave me the courage. And I came back to soft, uh, software field. My family is blessed. And I'm financially blessed. And the Lord also added me to the church. And I thank you. You've been a very a great blessing to me in the past and also today. God bless you, brother. I think if one of the disciples were disciples today, Maybe they wouldn't have been a fisherman. They may be a software engineer. So God needs software engineers too. Um, and uh, glad you could find a way to serve God. And that the Lord needs engineers. He needs doctors. Uh, in the first century, there, weren't, there wasn't software. So they had other professions. But today, we can be disciples, whether we're an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, or a business person. Uh, it's good that God can use this, use that. So God bless you and the brothers and sisters in Belor. Hi, brother. Praise the Lord. Uh, this is Shirley from Hyderabad CFC. Thank you so much for uh, today's message. I have increased a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. God bless you, sister, in Hyderabad. Thank you, brother. This is Sikora from Hyderabad, India. Uh, thank you for the uh, 10 values that what you taught. I really encouraged by that. I really want to write all the 10 values and keep it in my workplace. Well, I'll make it different. I'll make it actually special for any of you, not just answering the sisters. You can certainly write the 10, but write your own 10 values yourself. They may be different. And sure, you sure. Know, if they are different, um, you know, but make them biblically, biblically based of what you want to live your life by. And even if you don't get to 10, sure. if you get to five, you know, go and refresh those every year. And ask yourself, uh, you know, are those what you want to live by? So God bless you, sister. And uh, thank you for your, all of you in Hyderabad. I thank think that's you. a good note to transition on, uh, Sanjay. Thank, thanks for the inspiration for everyone to, to, base, to be inspired by the examples. Like you've been inspired by your father and your mother to create your own values uh, in the workplace. So Brother Matthew, if you don't mind, maybe we could just bring up those contacts. I've seen a lot of chat messages directly to me. 
And a common theme is um, I am, and I think yeah, I've seen this in Bristol, UK, in the UK, uh, elsewhere around the world. I am in need of fellowship. Uh, there are other people in my area. And we, we have a CFC church in London. Um, but the best way, and, and this could be for many of you, CT Fellowship, another brother from Buffalo, New York, reached out as well for fellowship. Uh, this seems like a common request. What I would suggest is you email this email address here, which is cfc at cfcindia.com, especially if you're in the Asia. It doesn't matter which part of the world you are in or one of the U.S. addresses above that. These are email addresses, info at rlcf.church or elders at nccf.church. If you're in the U.S., we can help you there. But certainly the cfc at cfcindia.com is sort of the global site uh, email address that you could send to. And we will definitely, somebody will respond to you usually within 24 to 48 hours. And we can very easily connect you to other people or elders in churches that are close by to where you live. Um, so if that is a desire of your heart, please, please uh, take note of those three email addresses and don't hesitate to send an email to us. That is the best way to get you connected. And I apologize if I've missed your chat on the Zoom chats. I've been getting a flood of chat messages, but this is the best way to get that personal attention. And then um, uh, again, the reminder on the YouTube channels, the daily devotionals, uh, take advantage of that as well. So hopefully that's plenty of information and there will be more such global sessions. One of the sisters mentioned, you know, uh, addressing a college age crowd. We do have, uh, a, hopefully doing this once a month or once every couple of months, sessions that are targeted for teens, targeted for young adults in their college years and, and a variety of speakers uh, that will be speaking to those audiences. So. Please stay tuned for more such global Zooms as well. Uh, with that, Brother Matthew, I'll hand it back to you if there's anything you want to add in closing. Yeah, so this uh, contact uh, uh, information, we can send it through the elders. So um, to different locations. So you, have, you, can, you can have it also, just like the notification has come. And... Um, yeah, so thank you all, brothers and sisters from all over the world to, who have come and uh, uh, attended this. And uh, I trust all of us have been blessed. And thank you, brothers uh, uh, Sanjay, for being with us and sharing all your experience, especially it comes from a humble heart that has blessed all of us. And with that uh, wonderful experience in um, workplace, thank you, Sunil, for doing that. Uh, very good moderation and uh, the wonderful introduction we gave of uh, Sanjay was a blessing itself. So, with all with that, uh, we'll end this meeting now. Bye, bye to all of you. Thank you, Brother Matthew, for organizing. It really took a lot of hard work. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, Sanjay, bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. There was, Thank a, group you, us. There was a group of us. Yeah. Thank you, Brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Sanjay, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Sanjay, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. From Georgia. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Sanjay. So, thank you, brother. Thank you all. Thank you all. Brothers, I'm just close, closing. They're closing the meeting, huh? Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Kevin, you can go ahead. Thank you.